So, um, members of the will want to note that today's meeting, he's very welcome to the weekly meeting, by the way. Uh, today's meeting will inform, will include a briefing from the four ports on EU um, exit preparedness, briefings on SAs and SR, and a number of written briefings. Uh, she will run out of time today, then a virtual meeting will be organised for tomorrow at 9am to deal with the rest of the agenda items not considered today, which should mainly be committee business. Morris and Patsy will be joining us by Starleaf. You're very welcome, at Morris and Patsy. And as we know, the committee um, will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament Buildings Online. And you can use your mobile phone devices provided that is there on airplane mode. Um, we have no apologies in today. And we're going to uh, receive an oral evidence from the Belfast uh, Foyle, Larne, and a Warren Point porch on exit preparedness. Um, I want to refer to members to pages six and seven. There's a memo from Stella in your pack, a briefing from the Belfast Harbour Commissioners at page eight, Foyle Port at page nine and ten, and from Larne Port at page um, eleven. I'd like to take this opportunity now to welcome by a Starleaf, um, Roger Armson, General Manager of the Port of Larne, Morris Bullock, Finance and Compliance Director of Alphys Harbour, David Holmes, Chief Executive of Warren Point Port, and Brian McGrath, Chief Executive of Foyle Port. So I'd like to take this opportunity now to uh, invite you to uh, commence your briefing. Hello. Hello, yeah. Hello, uh, this is Morris Bullock, so I'm here and connected. Yeah, I can hear you, Morris. <clears throat> Hello, this is Roger Armson. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. good morning. This is Brian McGrath at Foilport. Yeah, Brian. Yeah. That's it there. So, you just want to take the opportunity to, do, to commence your oral briefing? I'm sorry, I up. the signal broke up. Um, do you want to uh, to brief the committee here, do an oral briefing to yeah. the committee here? Yeah. Yes, we'll start now when you're ready. Sir, Chair, would you like me to start or would you like one of the other courts yeah. to start? No, no, you, you, you just take a, agree amongst yourselves. It's up to yourselves. Well, um, to my colleagues, are you happy enough that I commence with Belfast and then we all follow along after that? Yeah, go ahead, Laura. That's, that's fine for me. Okay, so well, okay, so um, well, firstly, Chair, um, thank you very much uh, for the invitation and good morning uh, to the committee. Uh, so my name is Morris Bullock, and I'm the Finance and Compliance Director here at the Port of Belfast. So I just wanted to uh, run through um, very quickly the briefing paper that I submitted. It's one page uh, long, so hopefully. Uh, it, it's not too difficult to digest, but the purpose, I think, of the church said is to give us the level of preparedness for Brexit. So I, said, I think the starting point for me would be to say to the committee that um, the Port Authorities, I think, in general, and Belfast, we have a perspective on the preparedness for Brexit, but probably the most overarching consideration for the committee is to sort of understand Perhaps just a little bit about the business model of the Port of Belfast and the other ports and understand our role and how the, the, sort of the ports industry operate. So, um, the, sim the simple message is that the Port of Belfast itself, as a strategy hub authority, does not itself engage in any trading of goods uh, across, across the port, both in and out. Uh, the, the Port Authority basically is an infrastructure provider. So we basically provide uh, the docks and the keys, uh, transit chains, a lot of the physical infrastructure. We also provide uh, safety of navigation, marine infrastructure dredging, stuff like that, the piloting service. And we provide various maintenance uh, facilities to the infrastructure that enables the port. But the actual carrying and throughput of cargo is carried on by a number of other parties. And I think it's probably best if I just sort of give you an impression of, of who those are. Well, firstly, you've got the individual traders, i.e. the owners of cargo that go through the port. Then you've got various haulage companies and hauliers who carry goods through the port. Then you have the shippers who um, obviously run the ships in and out. And then the port, you've got the port authority itself providing marine navigation and, and, and infrastructure services. 
And then probably for the purposes of this discussion, the most important uh, process of all is the role of the various government agencies in the court. Uh, they are obviously being very key, but also HMRC, and they're the ones who are responsible for the process of any checking that goes on under some other agencies such as Border Force as well. Um, alongside all of those individuals, we also have an array of various port service providers, principally chip agents, straightforward and the like, to act basically as intermediaries for cargo owners, employers, and the like. So there's a whole ecosystem of businesses that make up the operation of the port, and the port authority itself has a particular role in that, but it isn't sort of all encompassing or anything like that. So I think that's probably um, the starting point, well, and that is why I said at the very start that we can give our perspective of preparedness and we're engaged in various aspects of it. But, you know, I think, you know, it's, it's, the other people, the people who are most directly affected by the Northern Ireland Protocol will undoubtedly be the traders, colliers, shepherds, and the intermediaries, and then how government bodies respond to that. Um, you know, I've, I've put down some basic metrics on the Port of Belfast is the largest cargo carrying port in Northern Ireland, just under 70% of all trade uh, of Northern Ireland ports, according to the recent report from um, the Department for Transport. Uh, of Northern Ireland trade goes through the Port of Belfast. And just to give you the overall perspective, is about 70% of that trade goes straight to and from the island of Great Britain from Belfast. Um, like 70% is probably the overall Northern Ireland figure as well, judging by the, uh, the published statistics from the Department for Transport. Um, in my paper, I've pointed out you know, there's more export cargo to the island of Great Britain than there is import cargo. And the most important part of the trade for the purposes of considering the impact of Brexit is roll on, roll off ferry traffic, and that is the one that is going to be impacted. It's about 50% of our traffic overall, and all of that traffic goes to and from the island of Great Britain. So, obviously, at the moment, that operates on the basis of free flow between you know, both parts of the UK and our market. But that um, quite clearly will change to an extent, and that's the focus of the uh, I think of today, and I think it's the focus of our concern anyway. That's not to ignore the other 50% um, of our traffic which goes through either the bulk mode or the lift on lift off mode. But currently, we don't see any particular issues right now with those. We see the issues arising in the 50% of roll on roll off all of it going, uh, over to GB. Um, probably the best way to express the situation is that all of our cargo has been operating in free flow, and I think the overall objective that the ports would like to see, and I, I speak for Belfast here, but I'm, I would imagine the others will, will agree, is to preserve the free flow and traffic as much as possible because the island of Great Britain is such a large trading counterparty with uh, Northern Ireland. That's the first thing. But I think, you know, it goes directly to the question on the level of preparedness. Um, I think that, you know, there's not very much reassurance I could give to the committee about the level of preparedness for two reasons. The first reason is that um, we know there's a considerable body of work going on with DERA officials. We also know there's a considerable body of work going on with HMRC. But there is a lot of risk and uncertainty in the process because the preparations that are happening thus far seem to be largely dependent on the UK Northern Ireland Protocol Command paper that was issued in May 2020. Now, since then, uh, the UK issued on the 7th of August some more detailed guidance as to phase through and some more information is coming out just on the last few days. But basically, all of the preparations seem to be centred, in our perspective, mainly on you know, the Northern Ireland Protocol as expressed in the UK Command paper. And obviously, the committee will probably be more aware than I that that. Uh, the final form and outworking of the Northern Ireland Protocol has yet to be agreed with the European uh, the EU and the European Commission. Uh, that requires the Joint Committee, which we have no line of sight to at all. Um, so that is a risk and uncertainty. That, and that's probably this, you know, if there were two messages for us for the committee. Number one is the importance of preservation of free flow and, the, and, and maintenance of um, as, as as a free position as possible in trade and, and minimal friction, but also to note that until the Northern Ireland Protocol is agreed in its full form, the people who are responding to it, and it's not so much us, but others, including traders and, and government agencies, are still operating on an assumed basis and not the final basis. And I think that 
probably the main thing I would say about that. Um, I think just specifically on DERA, I want to say from the very outset, we've been, you know, I have to commend the work of DERA officials throughout this process. They've been very proactive. Um, we've been able to work and liaise with them, I think, very well in developing uh, the position. Uh, I understand that the committee had a much more potent briefing, uh, I think, a couple of weeks back from the permanent secretary of DERA on this. And to be honest, you know, I think I don't have any much to add to that. I mean, I did. Uh, quickly read through the minutes of evidence of that, and the honest, a lot of it was quite technical and over my head, but I think they are just not. So, um, there are obviously pivotal in terms of the delivery of uh, the North Iron Protocol. The other government agency is HMRC, because um, HMRC are really the lead agency around deployment of the uh, goods vessel management system, the GVMS. And I note in one of the questions that was submitted, you know, as supplemental to the invitation, that we were being asked for a view on the GVMS. Well, I think, I think it would be fair to say from our perspective that the operation of GVMS is absolutely pivotal to the delivery of the Northern Ireland Protocol, effectively, because that is the system, one of many computer systems operated by government that will enable um, the shipping companies to load, uh, you know, truck trucks on the GB side of the of, of, of the RST for transit over to Northern Ireland. So I think that so I, I would I would sort of stop there, Chair, about just to just to summarize though that um, in terms of the actual delivery from our perspective, the two key agencies are there on the SBS side and HMRC on the GBMS side. And I think that's a that's a bit of a simplification and there's many different strands of work going on as by other uh, government agencies as well. But I would say from our perspective there, the pivotal ones, and that, I think, will conclude my remarks for now. Chair, if that is all right. Yeah, thank you, Morris. <laughs> Maybe, um, do, do you want to take questions now, or go around the other? Go around the other one first, yeah. We'll do the others first, and then take questions. Oh, yeah, that's then, Okay. Okay, can we move around then to whoever wants to speak next? <laughs> Yeah, hi, hi. Good, mo uh, good morning, Chair. This is Roger Anson from Long Island Harbour Limited. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, Roger. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Morris, for your uh, very uh, clear uh, and concise uh, description. I, I just a few things to add to what Morris has said. Uh, I think there's two or three things in my mind, and I'm also the general manager of PO's Long Care Line Service, so I've kind of got a, a, a dual view on this. Uh, the first point I would make, and I would echo what Morris has said in terms of DERA working effectively with them, uh, I think uh, they have certainly been impacted by the length of time it's taken to receive authorizations to go ahead and get quotations, et cetera, et cetera, for the facilities that they need to build. Um, my opinion is that those facilities, uh, bespoke facilities, will not be ready by the end of the year. Uh, uh, but from a law and port point of view, I can confirm that we are in consultation and discussion with DERA, and I'm as satisfied as I can be that we will have a contingency in place uh, by December. So in terms of physical infrastructure, that's not my main concern. I think picking up on the point that Morris has made uh, and the discussions that I've been involved in with HMRC in terms of the operation of the GVMS system, that is a significant concern to me. Uh, and my honest opinion is that I do not believe that that system will be effectively ready. I asked HMRC if... Roger, we lost you there. Lost you, Roger. What systems did he not think would be in place? And maybe bring in um, foil and pick uh, yeah. line up again after. Yeah, C could we perhaps bring in foil, uh, Brian? There yeah. Maybe? If, uh, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I, I'm happy to step in and and, and just uh, give give the tech a chance to catch up with Roger there. Um, just to say, um, echo what in fact all of what Morris has said. Um, I suppose from Foilport's perspective. Um, it's different in, in as much as we're serving a city regional economy, uh, cross-border economy uh, in Derry, London, Derry, um, where the vast majority of the trade coming in through here is, um, is destined um, uh, for the border region. 
Um, and uh, in that sense, we aren't as impacted by the protocol um, structures around east-west or west-east trade uh, between DB and NI. So um, for us, um, we would also say that the, uh, the work with the DERA officials has been um, very, very positive, really strong engagement. And um, I, I think, although it was late in the day because of political constraints, once we got a chance to engage with the, uh, the team there, I think they, they've been absolutely uh, first class. Um, the arrangements for FOIL are well-defined and well in hand. Um, I think like Lauren suggesting, unlikely to be ready for January 1, but there is a contingency in place uh, that would impact our, uh, our, our business. Um, of more concern with us is the uh, interaction that we require with uh, HMRC particularly in regards to bulk trade. Uh, Foilport is, is, is operating in bulk commodities. Um, we don't have rural or low, low uh, ferry services here. Um, and there are issues around how we implement um, GVMS in relation to the kind of uh, cargoes that we bring into Foilport. So um, we're, we're engaged in, in very positive conversations at this time with uh, HMRC and Border Force. But similarly to the DERA officials, um, the extent of political uncertainty uh, has meant that those conversations have been really late in the day in starting. Um, whilst we've been on many calls through the summer uh, on quite generic and superficial uh, levels, um, we're only really now in recent days been engaged um, in, a, in a very focused um, set of conversations with officials about how these things will impact uh, phone port and our customers. And um, I, I would reiterate what Morris has said in as much as we are a trading platform, but we are not a trading organization. So um, we do um, have serious concerns about the, the traders and the agents and the, the shippers um, being able to comply with the new arrangements coming in within, say, 80 days or so until uh, the, the, the final leaving of the EU. So um, positive engagement with DARA, and uh, I, I think that's a very, a very encouraging thing. Um, but there's still much to be agreed in terms of joint committees and negotiations, I think, before the Northern Ireland picture is, uh, you know, is, is really clear. Thank you. Uh, Brian, um, Roger, are you back on board? Are you back online again there? Can you hear me? I can certainly hear you Come if on. you can hear me. We can hear you too, Roger. Yeah, we're going. Right. Perfect. Yeah, no, I'm on one of our ships at the moment. Um, just, just very briefly, uh, I think I just want to make the point about uh, GVMS. My opinion is it's not going to be ready by the end of this year, or if it is ready, it's, it is going to impact the flow of traffic into Northern Ireland. And I would strongly recommend that if it is in the power of this assembly to um, delay its implementation until uh, 1st of July of next year, in the same way as that would be for traffic coming out of continental Europe into the UK. I just don't think it's going to be ready. I asked on Tuesday that it be tested from the 1st of December and that was refused by HMRC. Yeah. That's really the only additional point I've got to make uh, on that on that particular matter. Um, do we have a, a okay, Roger? Thank you, Roger. Do we? Um, we have um, um, the Warren Point Port David Holmes on our list today. David, are you there? David. Oh, don't seem to have David, do we? Yeah, okay. okay then. Okay, then we um we're gonna ask well well basically that's the uh, the um the, your uh report or your oral or submission made. Um and I have a number of members here who want to ask questions. Can can you still hear it okay then? Yeah? Yes, yeah. Well that's yeah, okay. Yeah. Well I suppose maybe what what I will kick off uh, see, in relation to the, the Belfast 
Lord um, uh, Morris, um, you said on your um, uh, on the, on, the, on the written uh, report to us that the project is on the way to establish enhanced designated points of entries in the harbour, uh, Belfast Harbour, to allow enable these any checks that may take place. Where, where where is the port in relation to you know planning applications, scoping all that there out? Because um, uh, but heard some commentary from the. The dear old officials a couple of weeks ago that, that they're still engaging with with planners and assessing the needs. Where, where are you with actually the actual um, you know the pro the project that you refer to in terms of um, planning for any particular checks that may be needed? Like, uh, thank you, Chair. I heard that question, so I'll just uh, respond to that um, uh, specifically. So, the first thing to note is that the project for establishing the point of entry inspection facility is a DERA project, it's not a Belfast yeah. Harbour project, so they're the ones who are actually constructing it. So, um, the, the first thing to say is that uh, we know where the site is going for the bespoke facilities, and we breached agreement in principle with DERA some time back actually as to the location and we believe that they have now carried out the, the design for that. If we are interested in the era on a sort of liaising and assisting basis throughout. So the physical location will be um, land which the port will uh, provide to uh, the era. So that's the first thing. Now your specific question as to where they are in their project will not really for them, but our best understanding at the moment is that they are they have submitted uh, paperwork to do with planning, which I believe is being submitted under permitted development rights. So that was being done by DERA directly to the planning authority. And they are also out in a for the facility. So uh, as far as then of course there's, there's a number of other things going on beside that. So from our perspective we believe that DERA are 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 waiting are in the process of planning and in the process of tendering for so the construction. Now I have to make a chair. I'm obviously not authorised to speak for the era and I'm first by myself not interacting with them directly, but the um that's the situation. Um just to go on a little bit from that and I would echo the point made by Brian and by Roger that uh, it, it seems out pretty clear that the construct facilities will be ready. Will try will not be ready, will not be ready by the first of January, but um the contingency arrangements should be in place. So that that is a that's a summary of where we are on that facility. Okay. Uh, thank you, um Morris. Roger, you mentioned that the, the GVMS will not be ready by the end of the year. Uh, and the, the, the and you know what what will be the implication of that not being ready? What what possible contingencies could be put in place? Well, it all depends on what stance. Sorry, sorry, we've got, got a few announcements on the ship. It all depends on what stance the authorities take in respect to that. And just to be clear, that statement of mine is my opinion based upon experience of putting systems in place in the past. And, you know, we've only got 10 weeks until the end of the year, and there's still a lot of talk and discussion and debate about the system, so that does not give me confidence that it's going to be ready. But to come directly to your, your question, uh, in theory, if that system is not ready, then that will have a significant impact on trade flows between GB and NI. Uh, but then the authorities will need to decide on a way to allow that traffic to flow. Um, so, so that's really my answer on that. And that's why I suggested earlier on that actually the, the requirement to utilize GBMS should be delayed until uh, sometime next year, uh, in line with uh, traffic's coming out of continental Europe into UK. Thank you, Thank you for that, Roger. Um, we we'll move around the room here to my colleagues, uh, John Blair. Thank you, Chair. Can I can I thank the Port representatives for for the oversight and, and detail they've given us this morning. Uh, they've touched already. Uh, I was going to ask on the the working relationship with Dara, and and all reported seems to be positive. But but can I clarify uh, for the benefit of all of the committee what impact there would have been from any delays earlier in the year? From lack of through lack of preparation from the department and, and what impact that has had on current planning. In addition, can I, can I ask 
around preparedness, uh, what impact developing issues such as the Internal Market Bill are having on preparation for the ports, things that weren't envisaged a number of months ago but that are now happening, and I'm assuming that that's got to have some impact on current preparation. Thirdly, and separately, um, I was made aware yesterday of a plan of a local council, Mid and East Antrim, on, on, on this occasion, so di direct, directly related to, to Lauringport, uh, that 12 environmental health officers funded by the Food Standards Agency, facilitated by DERA, will be put in place now and start their training schedule soon. And then it will be reviewed if these people can't be deployed on the 1st of January 2020 through lack of lack of preparedness. Can I ask what involvement the ports have had in, in the preparation for that process and if they have been um, involved in discussions with local councils in this regard and also if they have been involved in discussions around how these people can be deployed if they are not ready to do their, their, their designated post on the 1st of January 2020? One, 2021, sorry. <laughs> Okay, I'll pick up on that there. Um, it's Roger here from Long Port, uh, Chair. Uh, if I could just pick up on the last question first, in terms of the deployment of DERA officials from a veterinary point of view, uh, we currently have an excellent relationship on the ground with DERA officials. They check all inbound and outbound uh, livestock and indeed uh, some other agricultural products and machinery. Uh, they're based uh, about 300 metres from the port gate. Uh, it may be that those 12 people are associated with that facility. Uh, for any new facilities and protocols going forward from the 1st of Ju or 31st of December, 2300, uh, the operation of those, uh, those staff is really a matter for DERA. All the protocols that we have in place and have discussed with DERA will simply mean that as a port, traffic will come and exit the port and proceed to the checking facilities once those bespoke facilities have been built. Uh, in terms of the contingency, they will be directed from the ship and to those facilities and DERA officials will deal with that. So. You know what they actually do within their facilities is really uh, their concern, providing it's carried out in a safe manner and within whatever agreement we have with them. So that, that's really the only thing I can comment on that. In terms of the new legislation that's coming through, uh, I forget the name of it, but you know the one I mean. Um, I'm not seeing any impact from that in terms of the port. The basics are still the same. Uh, Checking on photosanitary goods, uh, we reckon it's going to be about 1% of goods that are going to be checked on inbound coming from the UK. Um, and sorry, can you just remind me of your first question? Sorry, it's just gone out of my mind. Uh, the question at the start was around <coughs> the, the impact of uh, any lack of preparedness earlier in the process and any impact then from, from the growing from that, any changes such as impact of internal market bill. Okay, uh, I mean, in terms of the delays, uh, from what I understand, and again, this is just my impression looking from the outside in, is that uh, DERA were extremely diligent in trying to make this thing uh, proceed as fast as possible right from the start, I think as early as April. I remember receiving emails from one of their senior officials at 2300 on a Friday night and working with him over a weekend to get things done. I believe that part of the problem that DERA had was to do with waiting for approvals to proceed uh, on the project. Um, in terms of impact, uh, from an operational point of view, I don't see any significant impact because I think we can put in appropriate contingencies that will mean that from a facilities point of view, we'll have what is necessary to uh, comply with the NAI protocol. Uh, and in terms of the bill that you mentioned, as I said earlier, I don't, I'm not seeing anything specific that may impact our operations uh, that we don't know about already. Okay, Roger, thank you for that. Um, uh, I think we have, uh, before we move on ahead round, we have Warren <coughs> Point. Warren Point, uh, David, David Holmes, are you 
Can you hear us? Yes, I can. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, David Priest to meet you. Good morning. Um, would you like to maybe uh, give a, a bit of a, an oral presentation here to the, the committee? Um, well, uh, along with the, uh, the, the, the the rest of the country, we're, we're waiting to hear what, what the final arrangements are as regards Brexit. Um, the port has been working very hard. Our staff have been working very flexibly to ensure that uh, we can be ready for every eventuality. And um, we're currently working closely with Dara on contingency planning as well as trying to enable um, construction of the of the bespoke facilities that, that will be required for SPS checks. Thank you, thank you, David. Um, and how see in terms of your uh, of the, the facilities, um, where is it at planning stage? Because I'm aware that uh, my colleague uh, Sinead Annan had raised in recent time that. There, there's this, there's a, an ASSA in the vicinity of the Warren Point port. Uh, does that have any impl implications for any planning, or um, how can that be mitigated against? For? Well, of course, the Environment Agency sits within DARA, um, which, which DARA have, have reminded us of, uh, and, and, and we trust those processes. Uh, planning permission, DARA are, were responsible for applying for planning permission. And they have uh, done that through a club uh, based on the permitted development rights within the port. Um, Habitat regulation checks are are, are in are a, are a work in progress, as, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah, I believe there's an environmental impact assessment being carried out there. Um, that a few weeks ago. So, listen, I'm going to move uh, on ahead around the There's a number of colleagues down to speak here. Philip. Uh, thank you uh, for that. Uh, they caught me on the words there. <laughs> I mean, just in terms of, I mean, the, the, earlier on, uh, some of the quality was hard, so it was difficult to point, pick out uh, just exactly what was said, but there was concerns about more with uh, HMRC uh, issues. So, I mean, can I just ask, in relation to the Trader Support Scheme, you know, uh, how that may impact on, on the work that's been going on. I mean, do they feel there might be more required in relation to that and their opinion on the dual VAT system? I mean, I, I'm just asking it, that it, it, HMRC, as of, uh, as of yesterday, um, are, are still unable to confirm what the protocols will be for ROI traffic coming through Northern Ireland to GB, and likewise, GB traffic coming through Northern Ireland into ROI. So in the, in the context of Warren Point, where 40% of our, of, our, uh, of our cargoes would, would head south, it's vitally important that, that we secure clarification on that. Um, any other any thoughts on that? Well, on that question. Sure, I can I can just respond very quickly to that if I may. Though, unfortunately, I'm not sure my uh, response will be perhaps terribly helpful. Um, the question, firstly, was on the trader support team and also on the impact of that. Look, I mean, as I just said in my opening remarks, the uh, port authority business model itself, we don't get involved in trading uh, cargo, so. We, you know, we will not be operating a trader support team and I won't directly pertaining to our business. So, uh, you know, I'm not really wishing it to appear unhelpful. I don't think that is something that we would, would be within our remit of expertise to comment on beyond saying that it does illustrate a wider and much more fundamental point on the issue around trader preparedness and intermediary preparedness. Um, you know, that is, that, is, that is a wider question that is not necessarily directly within the purview of the court authorities. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, Morris, Rosemary? Yeah. Um, did I pick up you're not going to be operating the trader support scheme? No, the trader support scheme is, um, uh, is being provided by the government. It's not being provided by uh, the court authorities. It's actually a government scheme. And as I understand it, my best understanding of that is that we're traders, i.e. the people 
who bring cargoes through the port can register and obtain services to help them do uh, the requisite paperwork processes that are required to operate an overland protocol. And, and if, I, if I take you back, that service is also operated, I believe, by ship agents. So it's simply a third party service. And uh, certainly in the Port of Belfast, we ourselves have never operated ship, ship agency services or anything like that. And I would imagine that the other ports are similar. Okay, so it's of no benefit really to you? Well, uh, no, no, I wouldn't go and say that because remember, anything that helps the trader community respond to the Northern Ireland Protocol is most definitely a help if it is effective for the simple reason that our businesses uh, depend on trade going through the port and obviously anything that the government does to help that is a good thing so it is i would suggest it is very much a benefit to us but it is not a process that we are directly involved in okay thank you and mm -hmm. um, in relation to hmrc um you say it will not be ready. Is that because there's been a total lack of contact from HMRC from the start of this process? Is it only now they're becoming involved? Yeah, well, uh, sorry. I, I, I think it was uh, Roger who made those particular comments, but uh, from my perspective, there's been very long engagement with HMRC for a period of time. But actually, I think it would be fair to say that it's only in the last short while of a, of a number of weeks that the activity with the HMRC has really ramped up. And at the moment, it is probably a very significant focus of our activity in the Port of Belfast. But obviously, I'd let my colleagues in the other ports comment on that as well. Thank you. Yeah, if I, I would just re-emphasize that, that a lot of very generic calls through the summer uh, with um, whether it was the protocol delivery group or it was it, it, the HMRC border force reps. Um, but we are now seeing evidence. I, I guess it's because they now have better clarity from their political uh, masters themselves um, to be able to engage uh, in a more um, sort of focused way. And certainly foil point ports experience in the last week has been of a, a much more focused and uh, engaged uh, response from them, uh, which is ongoing, and would give us some cause for uh, optimism in terms of, you know, we're now finally getting to the nitty gritty on the subject. But I think um, a little bit like the Dara situation, I think officials have been tied very much by political clarity or, or lack of it. And uh, I think now that that seems to be progressing, uh, I think we're making progress. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Harry, thank you very much, Chair, and thank you, gentlemen. Morris and Belfast, you seem to be in charge of the practical and mechanical operations of the port. Have you been made aware of any new rules that you might have going forward, and specifically looking at the chief um, VMS? Will you be the one designated to be responsible for its operation? And I'm just wondering. Has there been engagement with ferry companies and haulage businesses? And does it have their backing? And the main thing would be, has there been any training on the new system yet for yourself and all our users? Thank you. Um, well, thank you. Just, uh, I think that, uh, that question touches on a number of very, very important points. And I think, you know, at the very start in my introduction, I think I did say that I think the uh, successful integration of GVMS into the business is absolutely pivotal to pivotal to the Northern Ireland economy. Sorry, Northern Ireland Protocol working. Now, you know, you asked specifically the question about GVMS. So, GVMS will not be a port system operated by the Port of Belfast. We have our own port management information system. Uh, the GVMS will be a facility operated by HMRC alongside, I think, one or two other key systems such as the Customs Declaration Service. So, firstly and foremostly, it is. HMRC system and they will be operating it. However, I think that, um, in, I mean, I think Bran put it very well a few moments ago, a lot of generic discussion with HMRC has very recently focused on very detailed uh, discussions in the last short while. Now, HMRC have recently produced some uh, data for us to look at in terms of the operation of GVMS and there will be basically five main levels of operation of GVMS. Um, it won't just be the Port Authority. We actually have a fairly 
uh, minor rule actually in the GVS operating model for the inbound GV to Northern Ireland traffic. It will start with the declarant, who is the person who actually is the trader for the cargo, and then you have the haulier involved, you have the shipper involved, i.e. the shipping company, the Port Authority has an involvement too, and then finally the government. So actually the GVMS system will be, although operated by HMRC, will be um, will be actually reliant on collaboration from the, the cargo owner, the haulier, the shipper, the Port Authority to an extent, and government itself. So it's kind of a multi, um, a multi, um, a multi stakeholder type system when it's in operation. Uh, that is exactly the sort of detail that is now being examined and worked through with HMRC as to how that will all work on the ground. Uh, you made probably a very significant point in your question about um, the role of the shipping companies. I think you're absolutely right to point out that in fact, you, you know, I'd say there's a strong arguable case that the shipping companies have a much larger role to play in the Northern Ireland Protocol than the port companies actually, to be honest about it, because they are the ones who will have to load trucks both sides of the Irish Sea. And my best understanding is that before any of the shipping companies can load a truck in England or Scotland to come to Northern Ireland, it will have to have an approval number called a GMR issued by HMRC out of the GFMS. And I'm just summarizing one of the routines in that. So you're quite right. The shipping company is totally pivotal to this as well. And I know for a fact that having just you know, spoken to the shipping company that they are uh, engaged as well as us with HMRC and how GFMS will operate on the ground. Uh, I'll pass you on then to my colleagues if there's any other points to make. Thank you. Um, okay, thanks for that. Uh, Claire? Thank you, Chair, and thank you for the, the presentations. I just want to congratulate you on your work done so far, and particularly as you've already pointed out, um, just given the, the lack of uh, agreements and clarity that has come uh, and the particular political environment that you're operating in. Uh, but suppose I want to look at, I um, want to ask you if you have any particular issues or concerns to raise about the continued lack of clarity on goods at risk and how that might um, uh, impact on your, your working environment and looking then at the, the traffic flow. So if um, I know that Warren Point has the, the plan of permission in for for their work to be done, but what what would you estimate from each of the ports would be the land size needed in order to facilitate the, the points of entry um, to try and mitigate against, you know, the traffic flow backups? I mean, uh, you know, are we, are we looking at a at a, a situation where lorries or traffic is going to be backed up onto the ferries or are they going to be taken off and put somewhere? What do those um, points look like um, and what size are they going to take? And I suppose maybe my, my last piece to ask is, have you any detail to give us on what are currently being discussed in terms of contingency planning? Well, I can I can start, but obviously you know, we'd like a comment from all the ports. So just to start off, um, the land check required for the DERA uh, point of entry inspection facility in Belfast when it's in its scope form is I think just under six acres. Um, you're quite right to draw attention to the issue of contingency. So we have reserved contingency land assets as well, just additional space that will be made available in the case that there is. Uh, uh, an additional requirement or not, that is probably the best thing that we can do because you're absolutely right. If there's any sort of interruption to traffic, the result will be consumption of land and that we have contingency arrangements in place. I think I've already mentioned, as it as is everybody, the contingency arrangements for data that are already in place. Um, the trucks backing up question is a very good question and it's one that we always keep under review. Now, you know, obviously, I think Roger would be in a better position to comment on this because he runs the shipping company as well as the port company. But um, my understanding is, generally speaking, uh, you know, truck don't just turn up at the port, they're all booked and allocated. So if, you, if you're not clear to load the ship, the truck probably shouldn't be on the port. So in theory, we should not see any trucks backing up. Um, but in the event that trucks are made under held, then we have additional land capability to accommodate those if need be. And that's one of the things that 
under constant review. Now, currently under the Northern Land Paper, remember the presumption remains unfettered access between traffic going from Northern Ireland to Great Britain, the island of Great Britain. So, um, if it's unfettered access, that implies it operates as it today, which means there should be no reason for it to be uh, stopped, except for in the instances of very few controlled goods, which are not a huge part of it. Probably the question then that would arise would be on the Scottish side and English side, uh, which is obviously where the focus would be because there is a pre-declaration, what's called a pre-lodgement model linked to GVMS, which means a truck will not load on the GV side unless it's got chain. And obviously then that depends on how the Scottish courts and the English courts are able to cope with that. I know this is kind of a long rambling answer in bits, but that that's, that summarizes it as best I can in, in a concise way. And I'll pass it over to Mike Mullin. Well, just, just just to add to that, if, if I may, um, and, and, and to clarify um, the, the last question too, um, sea truck who operate out of Warren Point have been um, immersed in the discussions that we have been having with the government agencies because they, they have a pivotal role uh, to perform. Um, in terms of GVMS, um, as, as Morris has just said, if the consignment hasn't been pre-lodged, it will not uh, gain entry to the ferry ship. So theoretically, uh, we won't have problem consignments arrive into, in, into Warren Point, which will help offset this, these potential queuing issues. Um, the area of ground that we have set aside is, is a very modest two and a quarter acres, which Dara assure us uh, fully meets our particular requirements. Um, and uh, as I think I said earlier, we're already working on contingency planning. What is essential, and, and I'm not entirely clear on this, is that the EU approve the contingency arrangements. Um, if there are queues, there is uh, there is limited additional capability within the port to try and absorb that. Um, but as I was talking about Sea Truck, and, and apologies, I was late to the meeting. But um, Sea Truck. Good morning. How are you doing? Good. How are you? Yeah, good. Thank you. Nate. Also, I uh, have to mention that um, the Sea Truck have uh, recently, along with the other ferry companies, um, identified uh, very concerning uh, manning arrangements on the ferries. Uh, where they had thought that their largely uh, Polish crews would be accommodated by uh, frontier worker status. That turns out not to be the case. And Sea Truck, and as I understand it, the other ferry companies are urgently pursuing some form of derogation uh, for seafarers involved in GB to NI uh, ferry crossing. And I'll uh, pass that question now on to my uh, other colleagues. <coughs> Uh, maybe I could just pick up on foil port. Um, I think we we have much less of a problem in relation to um, some of these interface issues than our colleagues involved in row row and low low uh, business um, in in the other ports. So the facilities required uh, identified by Dara are are modest. Um, we have them allocated within the port uh, estate, and we also have a three acre site identified as a sort of Brexit uh, contingency site, which was facilitated by uh, a grant from uh, the DFI. So uh, in that respect, we're, uh, we're well, uh, well across it. Um, I think your initial comments was a, a, was a really good point around goods at risk. And I think that that is something which is absolutely fundamental and yet to be resolved in terms of what, what you know, where the categories are and what, what uh, goods fall into those categories. Uh, but as far as it can be, um, let's say, organized and prepared for, uh, I think, because of the, the, the scale of the problem being less at Foilport, um, uh, it's easier for us to be ready in this instance. OK. Thanks very much. Uh, hello. Hi. Hi, it's Roger Roger's here. Can you hear me OK? Yes, Roger. We, got you. we hear you. We can't see you, but we can hear you. Ah, okay. Uh, sorry, I don't know what. Yeah, I've, I, yeah. Okay. Uh, I mean, just to pick up on a couple of points, uh, Chair. Firstly, I think it's about seven or eight acres that Deer have got outlined uh, uh, for the facilities. Uh, and just picking up on the GVMS, absolutely, is critical to the shipping lines. 
and uh, I'm not seeing a significant issue in terms of queuing on the Northern Ireland side. Uh, and I think, you know, most of us have got some contingency availability in the event that we did get a queue. Where I see the issue is on the Scottish side. And uh, at the moment, the, uh, the policy is that if a, a haulier arrives without a valid goods movement uh, record of GMR, they won't be allowed in the port. Uh, because um, by allowing them into the port, uh, that means that they've got the right to ship on board and come into Ireland, into Northern Ireland rather, and go through the HMRC system, which will decide whether or not they are going to be subject to some form of check following arrival into Northern Ireland. That, and, and the problem with uh, Scotland, uh, it, and for anybody, for those who don't know the ports, the distance between check-in and the main arterial route to the central belt and to England is very short, both for Cairn Ryan Port P&O and Loch Ryan Port for Stenline. So you don't need to get much of a delay to start backing traffic up onto those roads. And if you get a unit arriving at the gate which does not have a valid GMR and you turn that unit round and send it away, there are no facilities here in Scotland, uh, which is where I am now, is uh, to, for that unit to park up. So that's a bigger concern to me and something that we are looking at very closely. Um, this, the other point I would like to add is that for traffic coming out of Northern Ireland into GB, and, 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 and Morris has already said, you know, it's supposed to be unfettered access, there is, uh, the UK government have yet to confirm precisely what traffics are covered under that unfettered access scheme. And as somebody's already pointed out, there's no uh, advice in terms of dealing with traffic emanating from Republic of Ireland and transiting through Northern Ireland into GB. So, those are some of the key areas uh, and picking up uh, on the point that David made, absolutely there is a significant concern in terms of crews uh, for ships who are currently based in the European Union who we understand as of the 1st of January will not be able to work on our vessels. Uh, and. Um, you know, I think it's fair to say, particularly for the ferry operators, COVID-19 has been a massive uh, financial burden because effectively it destroyed uh, over the summer the uh, tourist traffic that we would normally carry. Uh, and, you know, the current status of COVID-19 is not helping that situation. So, you know, to say that the finances of, of shipping lines is difficult is perhaps understating it. So when you add all that together with the uncertainties around what we've just been talking about, you know, uh, the risk in terms of interruption of supply chains at the end of the year uh, needs to be raised. Yeah, um, thank you for that, Roger. I just want to just add a little bit to, on the back of what Claire said there. Obviously, it is very concerning for here, the, the prospect of of goods not being fit again, and, and we, we learned from previous ev evidence gathering sessions that there's 200 lorry loads of um, goods that come here today just to, to stock our, our supermarkets, come from, from across the water, um, and, and that's coming that way. But also, with that same principle, could that same principle apply to situations where, where, lo where loads coming from, from here across to Britain, and I know that unfettered access is guaranteed, but surely there will be there'll have to be some mechanism for segregating uh, and checking um, loads that are um, are qualified goods and those that aren't. And there's there any possibility for delay or impediment at your ports of, in the same principle of, of as as a haulier turning up to Larn or Cairn Ryan without the GMR record, would the same principle now apply to hauliers turning up at the ports here uh, um, maybe with, with loads of goods that, are, that, that don't actually qualify? Is there any potential for the disruption from that uh, perspective? Uh, there is. I think, uh, firstly, I, th I believe the number of goods that that applies to is going to be relatively limited. Uh, we do need the definition of what 
goods will be subject to those checks. And what I have suggested to the Scottish Government and indeed to HMRC is that those any checks that are required for outbound traffic should be carried out in Northern Ireland. And the reason I say that is because we're building the facilities that can carry out those checks. So why wouldn't you use those facilities in the same way as happens on the Dover to Calais route, where under the Latouquet Agreement, uh, checks to uh, exit France and enter the UK are carried out in Calais and vice versa. So you have UK border force staff over in Calais and French border staff over in Dover. So some sort of uh, derivative of that sort of agreement, I would have thought would have been practical. Um, and I think in terms of those goods, once the systems are sorted out, I see much less of a risk on that traffic than traffic coming into Northern Ireland. And I think one thing I, you know to say is that I think once the systems are sorted, uh, then and everybody knows what they're supposed to do and they've got trained staff and systems that work, I think the GVMS system will work in an extremely effective manner. My concern is that we're not able to test it ahead of the time that it goes live and it's then responsible for allowing free, free flow of traffic from GB into NI and that gives me significant cause for concern. Good, thank you very much. Um, Okay, we have Patsy. Patsy, Patsy Midlone, can you hear us there? Or thanks, no? thanks very much, Chair, and thanks very much, gentlemen, uh, like uh, for your presentation, because you you're the guys that are the practitioners, and you're the ones that are going to be landed with us um, uh, to try and work it through on the ground. Um, could we just ask, um, from from reading on the GVMS model, it, it appears that it'll probably be July before, in effect, it's operational. Now, uh, and, and thanks very much indeed, uh, Roger, for, for your insights there about the potential for tailback in Scotland, uh, because I was trying to work this through in my head how it might work, because the, from, from what I've read, there's the, there's the, the model that you've referred, that, that pre-lodgement model, but there's also the, the uh, temporary storage model. Now, um, mm -hmm. uh, um, Declan, was, was the tea chair, was teasing it out there as to how this might work from, yes, from Scotland over and then from here over there and you were talking through the, the lack of clarity about the traffic that may or may not be covered in regard to this so <clears throat> now, i'm looking at both models and forgive me i'm not a ports authority by any means manner of fashion i'm reliant on you guys to to give us the information but under both of those models that's the the pre-lodgement model you've talked quite a bit about that um is the, the temporary storage model is it is it some sort of a fallback position if the pre lodgement model isn't working, and then have you all got sufficient capacity if, for whatever reason, um, the system isn't operational and potentially we hit um, a no deal? In other words, um, I'm looking at what is your contingency in these situations. Everybody's referring, I have to say, everybody's referring to contingencies being in place, but I'm short on detail about what those contingencies are, or maybe. Um, so it'd be helpful, please, if you, if you could give us some insights into how you see the potential for those models working, and then what the contingency or fallback situations are in, in the event of A, a deal, and B, no deal. Okay. Uh, can, uh, thank you. Uh, can I, Roger here from LARP. Can I just pick that up in terms of, from a ferry perspective? In terms of the, uh, the temporary storage, that doesn't work with a ferry system. So to put it in very simple terms, the distance from the bow of the vessel in Larn to the port gate is 300 meters. Uh, and the vast majority of traffic, in fact, I would say pretty much all the traffic that's coming from Scotland into Northern Ireland is fast moving goods that need to be on the shelves quickly uh, because the route itself from a door-to-door -door basis is not the lowest cost route because of the distance involved. So if you're bringing a trailer from Wolverhampton to, to uh, Dungannon, for example, uh, driving all the way up to Cairn Ryan adds cost to your operation. And, but the reason that hauliers do that is because 
they have to uh, stock supermarket shelves for the multiples uh, that we all use today. So there's the temporary storage model doesn't work. It would simply put an impediment into uh, free flow of traffic. Uh, and that's why uh, the carriers and the ports are going with that uh, with the pre-lodgement model. In terms of contingency, and just to, uh, just to make a point, uh, the point I made about GVMS not being ready, that's, I have not had that advice from HMRC. That's simply my opinion, and I may be wrong on that, but that's based upon my experience, my opinion, based on the experience I have in this business. And the suggestion of July is simply to bring it into line with what's going on from, for continental to UK goods. In terms of contingency, um, in the event that GVMS is not ready, I think that if there is a will on all parties who are involved in this, and I suppose that would include the European Union, to my mind it's not beyond us to come up with some means whereby traffic can be selected for checks using uh, the information that the port, not particularly the port, sorry, but the shipping lines and the relevant authorities have to direct traffic in a manual fashion. I think that could be done and uh, it's something that I'm certainly turning my mind to now given this, the, you know, the, the things that I've heard this week. So I think that can be done but it would need support for it and it would need the blessing of, I understand, the UK and the European administrations. Uh, in terms, and I think you had a final point, I'm sorry, uh, it just escapes my mind. The, uh, yes, the, the, um, I appreciate you for taking time to talk me through that there. Um, what contingencies are in place? Well, obviously you have a contingency in place in the event of a deal, but a, a, new, a no deal situation. Oh, what? a no deal. Yeah. I mean, I mean, in terms of a no deal, uh, I suppose what does that mean? And my attitude to that would be is that Northern Ireland remains part of the United Kingdom of Great Britain, Northern Ireland, and we continue to trade as we do today. Okay. And, but I mean, again, that's, no, nobody's outlined that to me. Okay. I think that's grand, thank you. And perhaps the other gentlemen have, have anything to say from maybe slightly different geographical perspectives. Um, perhaps, uh, if, I, if I may come in, I, I think one of the issues around the no deal uh, provision, I, I, just to be clear, the contingencies that we're saying are in place are physical contingencies. Um, okay. The problem could well arise not from that perspective at all, but rather if we get into difficulties about how we operate like temporary storage models and the like with the HMRC, and quite often interpretation by officials can be, um, uh, can be something that uh, can be challenging in that regard. So in terms of the trade that we do at Foilport, um, I think it's fair to say that not a lot of consideration was given to the handling of bulk commodities in relation to the models that they have, pre-lodgement or temporary storage, because you would really need to have uh, facilities to replicate the capacity for, let's say, grain sheds. Um, you can't temporarily store 20,000 tonnes of animal feed on a key um, until it's cleared. So um, those are the talks that we're having now to try and find a way through this to see how we could adapt either the GVM, GVMS system or temporary storage models with the officials. But you can see that that's happening really close to the wire. So whilst we might be encouraged that we're now having the conversations, those are still uh, uncertainties that are, are not particularly helpful to our customers at the minute. Uh, but, but we do think that we're making progress through that. And I think one of the big things that we've, we, we're, we're wondering about no deal is whether the Northern Ireland Protocol actually survives no deal given the new bill that's been in place and the UK yeah. government's interpretation of it. So um, up to now, we had assumed that uh, the protocol would survive and that we would remain part of the, uh, the customs union in that regard and, the, uh, and we would deal with that element accordingly. Um, the political uncertainty about the uh, protocols uh, well-being um, would be something which would give us fairly significant concern. In, in, in a black and white no deal scenario, we could lose 40% of our trade. So it, it, it's a very significant issue for us that the trade flows are allowed to work as they, as they traditionally have done. Okay, thank you for that.
Thank you. Thank you for that there. I'm sure William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for your presentation, and I apologize I wasn't here for the, for the whole of the presentation. The promise from UK government on fettered access for Northern Ireland goods to the UK, and we hope we're, we're not possibly certain exactly how that's going to work out. Um, we're told that Warren Point Port is 40% of goods comes in actually goes on to the Irish Republic. That's a sizable amount of the goods that come into uh, Warren Point. I presume Lorne and Belfast would have a much lower percentage. Um, I would, am I right in saying that these goods won't have to be manually checked, that it will be done by technology? What, you know, it, it's almost sheerly impossible to, 40% of goods coming in that's earmarked for the Irish Republic, it would be uh, very difficult to manually check all those uh, a lot assignments. Uh, I think the other issue for me is when there's talks still going on, it's difficult and negotiations going on between the EU and the, and the UK government, it's difficult for you to be in a, to know exactly where you stand. And, and the, the level of preparedness is more difficult given that you don't fully on, none of us fully understand where this is going to end up and how late in the day the final deal will be done. Anything you want to pick up on that question from William there? Um, sorry, I, I, I didn't hear the end of the question, but um, I, I, think, I think the point is well made that um, none of us do yet fully understand the, uh, the full ramifications of, of, of what Brexit is going to be, uh, and, and therefore we all have to keep working uh, arduously to, to ensure we're ready for it. Um, 40% of goods in, in the case of Warren Point may head south, uh, that, but the, 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 the control protocols, I mean, the SPS systems, as, 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 uh, as the other boards have pointed out as well, you know, this is, it's, it's random sampling. It, it, that's not necessarily as arduous as it sounds. Um, so really just depends on, 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 on what, what, what the final rules are. Anybody else want to pick up on that question from William? Okay. Thank you. Um, okay, Morris, I'll go pick up yeah. Morris. Can you hear me? Morris Bradley? Yeah. Go ahead, Morris. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, gentlemen, for your, your presentation this morning. Uh, it's clear that our shipping operators are completely at the mercy of the final negotiations between the UK and the EU, uh, and the case of the last trader. Uh, but I would opinion that we knew the deadline, things will are paid quite quickly. Uh, and as we do, there's an even greater sense of urgency to have the necessary interest in case. But we've already heard that quite the best methods of operators in the case of the have we about the technology in Morris, Morris, you're cutting out there, Morris. You're cutting uh, out. You're, you're sort of. We find difficult to hear you. I'll get to the We can hear you better now if you can hear you in there. Right, right. Well, uh, it's just uh, a few concerns about technology being proposed, not, uh, not being tested. Yes, and as tra trade facilitator, facilitators, as the NA voice, would you all agree with Roger that, that delay in implementing the changes until next year? I think uh, July, Roger has suggested, would be beneficial. Well, I don't know where you or not, Chair. Yeah, well, Hello? Are you talking the, 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 the GVMS, uh, um, Morris? Yes. 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 Did you pick that up yep. there, um, Morris or, or, or David or Roger? Uh, I, I think any any provision for derogation uh, in the opening months can only be a helpful thing in the event that systems aren't ready. HMRC assured me last week, and I understand that uh, Roger is saying, you know, based on uh, based on hindsight and experience, that often new government systems may take some time to uh, to cut their teeth. But HMRC last week were extremely confident 
that GV, GVMS would be ready, would be operational in time, and that there is in fact a, a, a sandbox already available for people to start trying to familiarize themselves with it. So yes, in my opinion, a derogation both in terms of uh, contingency SPS arrangements and uh, other systems arrangements is, 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 would, is, would be a sensible precaution, subject of course to the EU uh, agreeing to it. Okay. Um, I would echo that. If you can hear me, Chair Morris yeah, here yeah, from yes, the Board of Health. Obviously, and any soft landing period to allow such a big change to come through would be a benefit, and probably would be a benefit also to the, the wider trader community as well. Remember, as I said, the effects of the North Island Protocol are going to be actually felt directly by traders, owners of cargo, and their hauliers and shippers. And that uh, the point that David made about GVMS, well, that's, a, that's the very same question we've been asking is to try and get in our heads a degree of confidence whether or not GVMS will be ready for Northern Ireland for the 1st of January. And, you know, no one can speak here officially for HMRC because they ought to speak for themselves. But I think, I think we're getting the same message that they're as reasonably confident as they can be given, you know, the circumstances. The, the question of an easement, of course, is relevant in the island of Great Britain because the UK government have effectively put in a six-month easement in stages for goods travelling between the European Union and Great Britain. Uh, so they, on the inbound, they have already sort of made sort of arrangements for a soft landing. Be anything equivalent in Northern Ireland, to my mind, would lead political approval from both sides, as David has said, the European and the UK. So that would largely be a political question. Okay. Thank you for that. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, as um, I have no members joining me this now to ask any further questions, I want to take the opportunity now to thank yourself, Roger, Morris, David and Brian for a very comprehensive briefing and for taking time out of, no doubt, was a very busy and hectic schedule to address us here this morning and for the provision of the, the written briefing that you um, provided to us. So I want to thank you uh, very much now and, uh, um, and this just, just want to you can uh, you can log off now okay then thank you very much okay uh, thank you Charles. thank you committee members take care now bye bye uh, okay um we're going to close session now and um the witnesses obviously have uh, are lo logging off here can i ask the communications to you now add all members into the spotlight and i'm going to turn off this red button committee room 30. this is the northern Ireland assembly committee room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. We're back live again. Um, okay, members, you will recall that we've been asked by Deirdre to consider 14 SAs at the committee meeting today. And we considered this last week and agreed. We agreed to rearrange our agenda, taking all oral evidence first and all written briefing and committee business at the end. This was allow that if the committees ran over, we could do all our written briefing, our written business virtually. However, to date, only seven of the SAs have materialised. Three were received in time to go into the pack on Monday, three were received on Tuesday afternoon, and one on Wednesday morning. I want to advise members the committee office did not receive any additional papers in time for the table papers to be issued yesterday at 4.15pm. That means that for those SIs for which we have no briefing papers, uh, have no briefing papers will not uh, will not be considered. Many had already sent a letter to the minister, copied to the permanent secretary regarding the arrival of SIs to the committee, as well as the inadequate information provided on the SIs. We are aware that Dira, Dira is uh, partially at the mercy of DEFRA and BEAS in connection with these SIs. Nevertheless, officials are on call today to explain the consequences of the committee not receiving the information on time. To help with an orderly consideration, the SIs under consideration of today's meeting have been organised into three distinct groups, chemicals, waste and agriculture miscellaneous, uh, miscellaneous. There will be one overview briefing on each group, followed by a Q&A for all the SIs in that group. The committee's decision on each SI will be taken individually and after the briefing and q um, Can I say that members may wish to focus their attention on the Category 3 essays? Um, and Deira has asked that we take the Waste SA as the first group. Are members okay with that? Yep. yep. Okay. okay, the first group for consideration is Waste. Uh, this should have been included in the following essays. SI DEFRA AQ04 Air Quality Northern Ireland Protocol Regulation 2020, 
That's a DEFRA, WST04, the Western Agreement Permitting Accepting Amendment, EU Agent Regulation 2020. That's a Category 3. SIBEASTP048, the Transfrontier Shipment of Radioactive Waste and Spent Fuel EU Exit Amendment Regulation 2020, Category 2 Reserve. SIDEFRA WST09, the Hazardous Substances and Packaging Legislative Functions and Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020 Reserved. And the SIDEFRA WST008, the International Waste Shipments Amendment Plastic Waste Regulations 2020. As of 6 p.m. last night, only one of the above SIs has been provided, which is SIBEASTP 048, the Transfrontier Shipment of Radioactive Waste and Spent Fuel Amendment Regulation 2020. It is reserved, which means it is for information and noting only. Can I suggest to members that we ask officials to explain why the other SIs were not provided in good time, and then what, uh, and that we then move on to the next group. Okay, so I'd like to uh, welcome um, John Mills head, uh, by Starleaf. John Mills, Head of Environmental Policy Division. Alison James, the Assistant Director. And Wednesday, Wendy Lindsay, the Deputy Principal. And can I ask officials, um, you know, okay. So I suppose um, to ask maybe to kick off with John and Alison on Monday, you know, can you explain why by only one of the SIs in this group has been provided, and what are the consequences of the committee not being able to consider them, and will the Minister still give consent for the revisions that apply here to be included in the SA? Okay, uh, so could you want to just uh, please kick off there? Go on, Alison, for Wendy. Oh, uh, sorry, I was having uh, trouble hearing there. Can, can committee members hear me okay? Yeah, yeah, okay. Yes. Uh, yep. Right, good morning, Chair. I think also with me is, is Janice Harris. I'm not sure if she's on the call, but uh, she also works on waste. Um, okay, I'll uh, come to those questions. Uh, the committee has asked that we cover these SIs on waste uh, as far as, as part of the procedure for the SIs. Uh, that involves the Minister writing to the, uh, the De DEFRA Minister writing to the Northern Ireland Ministers to obtain their consent for SIs. Uh, that concern devolved matters, and the minister in turn seeking the committee's recommendation on whether it's content to agree that the SI is delayed in Parliament. Uh, the SIs on waste and chemicals, which you're considering next, are part of a very extensive programme to deal with EU exit. The environment comprises half of DERA's legislative programme. The number and speed at which the SIs are being progressed is more normally what we would uh, be doing in a year rather than the space of a, a few weeks. Uh, and this is certainly not how we would uh, prefer to engage with the committee. So uh, uh, apologies for um, the lack of papers and the uh, pressures on timing. Uh, the, the, the timetable is, I should emphasize, uh, the UK uh, government's timetable and not ours. Uh, on waste uh, SIs, uh, we are not in a position, as you've said, Chair, to ask for the committee's recommendations on the SIs dealing with the waste and environmental permitting, etc. Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020 and the Hazardous Substances and Packaging uh, Legislative Functions and Amendment EU Exit uh, Regulations 2020 or the International Waste Shipments Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2020. <coughs> As far as the timings of the SIs is concerned, the government's, uh, that is DEFRA's, stated aim is to lay the first two of these waste instruments on the 14th and 15th of October. We understand that the scrutiny committee at Westminster, uh, that's the Joint Committee on Statutory Instruments, has raised some technical issues about these SIs, so we do not have a final version of them. In addition, we are having discussions with DEFRA about the extent to which the matters dealt with in these SIs are reserved or devolved. Uh, we are also discussing the impacts of some of the measures in the SIs. The laying dates may slip or DEFRA may proceed to lay the SIs. As far as the International Waste Shipments Amendment EU exit regulations are concerned, they have been pulled from the programme and we await a new laying date. Again, uh, we uh, are having debates about the uh, extent to which this instrument is uh, reserved or devolved and about the impacts of uh, that instrument. 
Uh, finally, the International Waste Shipments Amendment plastics waste regulations are not due to be laid until December, and we do not have a draft of those at this time. Um, I'm happy to give a description of what those regulations concern, if, if the committee would find that helpful at, at this stage, or we're happy to answer questions on them. I think we'll move to, to uh, try, uh, members may want to ask questions at this stage, would that be in order? Yep. Okay. <coughs> Members want to ask questions at this stage. John? Uh, can I ask a very quick question? Uh, I'm doing so deliberately because this is, um, as members may know, Clean Air Day. Um, and I'm therefore uh, very keen to know the, the up to date situation on the Air Quality Northern Ireland Protocol Regulations SI, um, on which we haven't at this point received papers. But given the, the, the relevance of that matter to, to today, and given the, the urgency around the timetable, of those SIs for which we haven't received papers and indeed many other matters related to, to EU exit. Um, I'd be keen, because of the date today, to have a, a, an update on progress on that SI in particular, although obviously we can't scrutinise it properly until we have the full paperwork uh, in place. Uh, the, um yeah, the air quality was to be uh, was scheduled for the fifteenth uh, uh, of October to be laid. Um, my, it's one of the chemical ones, really. Um, it doesn't, um, although it's called air quality, it deals with a range of matters, uh, to my recollection. Um, uh, but uh, I think that there have been. Uh, 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 there's revision to that SI, so again, we do not have a final. Um, uh, we do not have a final version of that particular SI to send to the uh, to the minister, let, let alone the committee at this time. Uh, uh, Dave Foster or Caroline Barry be able to confirm what I've said on that uh, instrument. If members, uh, any more questions in relation to that there? Okay, so we can move uh, for to committee consideration of the, the waste SIs. Um, okay, so we'll get some evidence, well, on the DEFRA AQ04 air quality regulations. Now, we have no uh, papers received for this SI, and we really, we, we, we can't consider it, but is there any oral evidence relating to it or any... Uh, comment related to that AQ04 Air Quality Regulation 2020. Sorry, any uh, any any briefing on air quality? Yeah, yeah we haven't got oh, yes. papers. No papers received. That's correct. That essay, yeah. Um, that would be, uh, uh, in terms of any uh, further briefing on that, um, that would be. Um, that's one of the chemicals SIs. So, um, if I could ask my uh, my my colleagues covering chemicals to uh, provide any briefing on that um, in the next session, as you say, Chair, it's not ready yet. Okay. okay then. Okay, we have, then we have um, oral evidence uh, from Dara on um, Dara SA DEFRA WSTO4 the waste and environmental planning. Um, Amendment EU Act Regulation 2020 as a category three. Um, we haven't got papers, um, and we can't consider it either. What's the update on that one in terms of? Okay, so uh, this SI uh, relates to three directives in uh, Annex Two of the Northern Ireland Protocol: Packaging and Packaging in Waste, Packaging Waste uh, Directive, Producer Responsibility, Batteries and Accumulators, uh, and. Uh, the uh, restriction on the use of certain hazardous uh, substances in electrical and electronic equipment known as the ROS Directive. Uh, this is a UK-wide SI which amends UK-wide legislation which underpins uh, mature, well-established UK systems, including largely those for producer responsibility. Uh, the instrument is largely technical. It mostly makes minor amendments to existing waste legislation to ensure it complies uh, with the EU uh, withdrawal agreement act 
at the end of the implementation period and it amends uh, a number of technical things like uh, uh, the definition of implementation uh, period. In respect of the ROS directive, it removes Northern Ireland from the UK system of ROS introduced by the No Deal uh, legislative uh, exercise from, 2000 and, uh, from last year. And there is a related uh, SI uh, uh, WST09 in relation to ROS on this. Uh, the most um, uh, recent position on this is that uh, the, 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 uh, there were amendments, uh, technical amendments to this legislation being recommended by the uh, Westminster Scrutiny Committee and uh, therefore we cannot be uh, clear that we have a final version of this SI. In addition, we're having de ongoing debates with DEFRA about the extent to which this SI is reserved and about the impact of this SI. Um, and uh, so we are not in a position to um, brief the committee uh, definitively on this today. Okay. Um, okay, so. Okay. Chair, so when we're hearing that that's uh, largely technical, it's, it's listed here as a category three, three yeah. um, which indicates that there could be policy. significant policy implications there as well. Yeah, John, are you aware of uh, yes. a class of good, uh, it's, it's categorised as category three, so, which normally involves substantive policy changes. Are you aware of what those substantive policy changes may be? Claire asked the question. Uh, yes, certainly. Um, I'll ask uh, if, if any of my colleagues want to follow uh, on me, if Janice wants to add anything. But the, uh, it, it does make um, largely a series of technical changes. Um, but uh, one of the effects of these technical changes um, is that we are concerned about uh, the application of uh, uh, EU regimes uh, to, uh, to small businesses in Northern Ireland. We uh, are concerned about a risk that, um, that if you like to, to um, use a bit the not very accurate language, heavy duty uh, regimes will be applied to very small businesses who are going to have uh, um, a, a lot of difficulty uh, coping with the bureaucratic uh, nature of, of some of those regimes. And, uh, and that, that is where our policy concern lies. It has to be said that the, that policy implication really arises from the implementation of the Northern Ireland Protocol rather than uh, the, the legislation itself. But the, the effect of the legislation uh, is, is to do that, and that's the policy concern we have in that area. Do you want to add anything, Janice? No, no, that's it in a nutshell. It's, it's the impact on businesses that, that aren't um, affected by this regime at the moment um, uh, and, and what it means for them in practical terms. Okay. Thank you, John and, uh, and uh, Janice. Um, okay, so um, moving on then to number five, then the um, oral evidence on the, uh, uh, the SIBEIS TP048, the Transfrontier Shipment of Radioactive Waste and Spent Fuel, EU Exit Amendment Regulation 2020, that's a Cali 2 reserve. The briefing paper is at page 39 of the table papers, um, and I want to advise members this is a, a reserve matter, and it's for information and noting only. Okay. Uh, okay. Do you want me to say a few words about yeah, that, Chair? Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Go ahead, John. Okay. Uh, thanks. So, the Transfrontier Shipment of Radioactive Waste and Spent Fuel EU Exit Amendment Regulations, um, the, the, the letter has gone to the committee um, yesterday, I believe. Apologies again for that. Uh, the regulations are expected to be laid on the 14th of October. Uh, these regulations, as you've said, are reserved, so consent is not being sought from the Minister and therefore we're not seeking the Committee's agreement on the laying of these regulations. How we, however, we would invite the Committee to note them. Uh, the regulations implement the rules for control of the movement of radioactive waste and spent fuel between EU states. They are necessary to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol as Council uh, Directive uh, 2006-117 Euratom on the supervision and control of radioactive waste 
and spent fuels is one of the items uh, listed in the EU environmental legislation in Annex 2 to the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, and it applies to the UK in respect of Northern Ireland. In practical terms, uh, Northern Ireland sends only a, a very small number of consignments of radioactive waste uh, to GB each year, receives none and sends none to other EU countries. These regulations do not make any policy changes to existing arrangements and therefore will not have uh, impact over current arrangements. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. So the next one we're going to look at here then is the DEFRA WSTO9 hazards of substances and packaging that's the function of the amendment of the EU exit regulation 2020. Again, there's no, no papers received for this one, this SA, and we can't actually we can't consider this by the committee. We can't. Um, any comment on that one, John? Or? Yeah, sure. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, this is and the ROS directive. So it's very allied to the, to the one we've already talked about, which is WST04. Um, turning to this ROS directive, it, uh, it places restrictions. Um, it restricts certain hazardous substances in electrical and electronic equipment uh, placed on the market in an EU member state. The aim of the directive is to reduce the environmental effect and health impacts of uh, uh, substances in electronics while the Packaging and Packaging Waste Directive uh, prevents the presence of noxious materials in the manufacture of packaging. Um, this is traditionally regarded as a reserve matter, um, uh, and this is a UK-wide SI. Um, as I've said, we do have some debate with uh, DEFRA about whether um, it is reserved, uh, because while things like trade and, and placing um, goods on the market uh, do fall into the reserved area. Uh, the, you know, this, has, this is a, a directive designed to cope with environmental impacts of these hazardous substances in, in equipment or in goods. And that the environment is, of course, a devolved matter. So that is an ongoing uh, legal debate. Um, so that, uh, that's where we are on that. The SI is largely technical and makes minor amendments uh, in itself. Um, but uh, as we've already said, with regard to the, to the effect of this uh, um, uh, SI, we are um, debating with DEFRA uh, policy around the effect it would have on Northern Ireland small businesses. Okay. Right, uh, thank you for that. And, and then item seven then, John, is the uh, oral evidence on the DEFRA WST008 international waste shipments um, regulations. If no papers in that. Uh, Okay, so uh, thanks. The, um, the International Waste Shipments, which is uh, WST05, um, uh, this SI relates to uh, EU Waste Shipments Regulations, which is again in Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol. The Waste Shipments Regulations establish procedures and a control regime for the international shipment of waste in order to improve environmental protection. Uh, procedure and controls are dependent on the origin, destination and route of the shipment type of waste shipments and the type of treatment to be applied to the waste at its destination. Um, they are, again, these regulations in themselves are largely minor and technical. Uh, the minor amendments are to existing waste legislation to ensure it complies with um, EU withdrawal, with the EU Withdrawal Act. Um, but the substantive uh, amendments proposed in respect of Northern Ireland concern really the movement of waste between Northern Ireland and GB. Uh, and those um, movements, which are controlled by a domestic um, regime at the moment, could fall under, uh, again, the rather more onerous international regime, uh, and some waste movements could be prohibited. So again, we, have, um, we are debating with DEFRA uh, the, uh, uh, about the impact of these regulations and the uh, and the uh, and the nature of whether they're reserved or, or not. So similar to, to the other two, that we're not in a position to provide the, the committee with uh, definitive regs or, um, or or advice on at the moment. Thank you. Chair. 
Uh, Claire? Can I just ask, just on that one and also the first one we were talking about in the air quality, they're both um, listed here still to be confirmed in terms of their categories. And I'm just wondering, have the have you got any indication of whether there will be significant policy shifts within those? Will there be category threes? Is really, I suppose, a quick question. Do you know? Uh, well, I think that's a, the, the, the categorisation is, is pretty subjective. I would say uh, that this is a significant one um, uh, uh, because of, of the effect of the way it implements the, the Northern Ireland Protocol. So I would, off the top, if we haven't provided a categorization, I would say this one should be a, a category three. Um, the air quality, again, my, my colleagues covering chemicals will, will, will have a better idea than me um, what that should be. I, I think that makes a series of rather uh, uh, technical changes across the um, uh, uh, across the, the piece. And I, I thought it was maybe not a, a, a category three. Thank you. Okay. okay, folks, the second group of uh, for consideration is chemicals, and this will include the following the um, SA, uh, DEFRA, CMH10, REACH, etc. regulations, category 3, SA, DEFRA, DET03 detergents, category 3, the SA, DEFRA, CMH12, the control of mercury, uh, SA, DEFRA, ODS03, uh, greenhouse gases. SA DEFRA C uh, HMO7, the persistent organic uh, pollutants. Uh, SA DEFRA PAESO7, the pe pesticide regulations. SA DEFRA AQ04, the air quality regulations. Um, there's a, a, a briefing paper from the clerk at page four of the table of papers, and this has issues and matters that members may wish to explore. Um, again, I want, can I ask members to note that at 6 p.m. yesterday, no papers have been received for SA DEFRA CMH, CHM12, Control of Mercury, uh, and for AM, the, um, the Control of Mercury, uh, and for AQ04 on air quality, uh, and they uh, cannot be considered by the committee today. In addition, CHM10 and DET03 and ODS03 were received late. The papers were tabled for members, give them around 18 hours for consideration. So I want to welcome back on to start this again, uh, John, um, Mills, Head of Environment Policy, D uh, Dave Foster, Director of Regulatory and Natural Resource Policy, and Caroline Barry, Acting Head of Chemicals and Industrial Policy Branch. Uh, we also have Tommy McNamara, Staff Officer, Regulatory, Regulatory and Natural Resources Policy, Eamon Campbell, Head of Water Policy, and Colin Nugent, the uh, Environment and Health Officer. So can I ask the officials to explain why one of the SIs that we were expecting has not been provided, and if the minister intends to give consent to it being laid, um, maybe the officials want to take a take a ten, maybe ten minutes or so, or thereabouts, to give an overview of all of the other SIs in the chemical group, um, and obviously members will want to ask questions. Okay. Um, thank you, Chair. Good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, okay, Dave. Okay, well, thank you, uh, Chair, and uh, uh, good morning. As I said, uh, with your permission, I'll just make a few introductory comments in relation to chemicals policy and legislation, uh, the links that chemicals legislation has in the Northern Ireland Protocol, uh, and then in particular the, the SIs, which we are with the committee this morning for your consideration. Um, so, obviously, chemicals are an integral part of modern society, uh, production and consumption of chemicals arising continually as the market for chemically intensive products such as computers, furniture, personal care products grows. Uh, I think around 95% of all manufactured goods rely in some form on industrial chemical processes. Uh, the, the EU is Northern Ireland's biggest export market for chemicals and chemical products uh, with around 70 million worth exported in 2019, uh, which is around 56% of Northern Ireland chemicals and chemical products exports. That's also uh, the largest import market with around 48 million of, uh, imports in 2019, which equates to 66% of the Northern Ireland imports of chemicals and chemical products. Uh, DERA is the lead Northern Ireland Department for Chemicals Policy uh, with specific regulatory and legislative responsibilities for REACH, which is the registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals, persistent organic pollutants or POPs plant protection products, pesticides, fluorinated greenhouse gases or F gases, 
uh, ozone depleting substances or ODS, detergents and also mercury. Of these, REACH is the main piece of EU law which protects human health and the environment from chemicals. In addition to having joint competent authority responsibilities there on REACH, uh, the Department of Economy and the Health and Safety Executive for Northern Ireland are also responsible for a number of pieces of other chemicals legislation, uh, in particular the classification and labelling CLP, the pesticide, the biocides regulations, uh, and also the prior informed consent regulations. Uh, these obviously are, are not for consideration uh, with this committee at this time. So the EU Withdrawal Act uh, 2020 has amended the uh, previous EU Withdrawal Act uh, 2018 to incorporate the uh, NI protocol into UK law. Uh, that enables the UK government and devolved administrations to make regulations to implement the arrangements necessary to comply with the protocol. Uh, and these regulations are subject to approval by the relevant parliaments and assemblies. Under the uh, protocol, when the current transition period ends, Northern Ireland will be required to relate, remain aligned with a variety of different EU chemicals legislation, uh, in particular REACH, uh, the POPs regulations, the plant protection product regulations, uh, regulations relating to F gases, ozone depleting substances, detergents and mercury, uh, as well as a number of other regimes for its uh, health and safety executive via the Department of Economy yes, responsibility. So following the end of the transition period, uh, uh, Britain will effectively become a third country in EU terms. Uh, and if over time, UK chemical policy and legislation diverges from the EU's, it's likely that there may well be uh, a quite a, a wide impact on how chemicals are managed, regulated and traded across the UK and beyond. Uh, so in particular, the protocol articles five and nine and annexes two and four require that certain elements of EU law continue to apply in Northern Ireland. This has necessitated the programme of legislation to prepare for 2021 and beyond, uh, which you're considering today. Uh, the SIs that we're talking about uh, largely make technical and minor changes to implement the protocol uh, and do not of themselves make substantive policy changes. Uh, however, there are potential impacts from the legislation's application of the protocol, uh, perhaps in the same way that John alluded to for some of the waste legislation. Uh, the the uh, fact that the protocol requires different legislation arising from the EU to remain in place here uh, may potentially have impacts uh, on businesses uh, and it's really the, the protocol itself rather than the amendments that these SIs bring that are, are causing that issue. Um, so as part of the programme today um, there are I think uh, six, uh, seven uh, SIs uh, for consideration of, of which two, uh, as the Chair has indicated, haven't yet uh, uh, been tabled uh, for a number of reasons. Um, if the uh, committee uh, wish, we can go through and outline broadly uh, the background to those SIs or are happy to take questions. People want to take questions or ask questions? No? If you want to just broadly then, or and briefly and broadly, just go through the background to them, that would be helpful. Okay, well, I'll perhaps uh, hand over policy colleagues to just give a, a, a brief overview of the uh, of the five SIs that we're, we're specifically looking at today. So uh, perhaps Caroline, Barry could just give us a, a very quick uh, overview of the REACH SI. Thanks, Dave. Uh, yes. Uh, sorry, can you hear me okay? Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Caroline Barry. I'm, I'm currently acting head of the uh, Dairy Chemicals and Industrial Policy team, and uh, I'll give you an overview on the REACH, um, et cetera, amendments, et cetera, EU exit regulations 2020. Um, as you're aware, REACH um, stands for the, for the Registration, Evaluation, Authorization and Restriction of Chemicals. And the regulation for REACH um, uh, from the European Commission number 1907-2006 is a EU regulation that affects the supply and use of substances. It came into effect and force on the 1st of June 2007 and replaced a number of European directors and regulations with a single system. Um, the European Chemicals Agency, or ETSHA for short, coordinates uh, REACH across um, the EU. 
Now, the EU REACH regulation um, covers the manufacturing, placing on the market and use of chemicals to, to the extent they're not otherwise regulated through sector-specific legislation. And it covers things like um, uh, plant protection products, biocidal products, detergents, medicines, cosmetics, uh, your, uh, environmental permitting of industrial sites or worker protection legislation. So I thought it was just to give you a, uh, useful to give you that bit of a background before we go into what, what these new regulations actually do. Now, um, uh, as you're aware, um, the regulations, the REACH exit, amendments exit, the EU exit regulations 2020 under consideration today, expect it to be laid on the 15th of October. Um, a letter uh, inviting the committee to agree to the laying of the SI has, uh, as far as I'm aware, been shared with the committee. Um, the regulations ensure that the EU le that UK legislation established in the regime that controls and enforces the use and movement of chemicals will continue to be operable in Great Britain after the end of the implementation period, and that the EU legislation controlling chemicals in Northern Ireland is applied here. Uh, these regulations are needed because of uh, inclusion of the EU, EU REACH regulation in Annex 2 of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now, this instrument also amends the traditional provisions in the REACH, um, um, ex, etc., Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2019. And um, the, these are known as the Exit Regulations in, in UK. To, um, mitigate uh, potential disruption to industry and move to the new system. And it makes some minor amendments to ensure cross-references cross to the UK's REACH legislation are up to date. Um, the area uh, is partially devolved, so Ministry of Consent um, is, sought, is being sought and the committee will be asked to agree to the laying of regulations. It's also make you aware that it's a cross-cutting with DERA, DERA and the Northern Ireland um, Department for Economy sharing Northern Ireland REACH competent authority um, responsibilities and, and decision-making responsibilities for REACH. And in practical terms, um, the REACH controls affect significant areas of economic activity. The regulations do not in themselves make policy changes to existing regimes. Sorry, but in effect, um, uh, implement the Northern. Ar uh, but in effect, in implementing the Northern Ireland Protocol, imposes restrictions, prohibitions, and um, additional checks between Northern Ireland and GB with the establishment of separate GB and Northern Ireland regimes. Now, clarification of the amendments in this area, as, as John's already mentioned, is dependent upon um, clarification of aspects of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Protocol, and um, particularly in relation to heavily regulated goods and the Northern Ireland qual qualifying goods. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, if it would be helpful, would the committee want to um, pick up questions around this SI before we move on to uh, introduce the others? I mean, I was going to ask a question on it anyway, uh, just in relation to the disruptions that Caroline talked about. Uh, I mean. Mm -hmm. Could she maybe give us a bit more clarity on the potential disruptions that are likely to happen, and if, if you have assessed, uh, you know, if they are occurring, when, how, what the impact of the disruptions are going to be? Um, just to uh, just to clarify, there is some mitigating measures that already is in the SI to, to try and reduce those. Uh, but one of the areas we had some initial concern uh, was in terms of uh, where you had existing supplies of chemicals um, that were being imported from um, GB into Northern Ireland. That um, under the current EU reach system, um, Northern Ireland would be classed as a downstream user. But because of now um, with GB having its own REACH system set up, um, what will happen is that now downstream users will effectively become importers because Northern Ar because GB will be treated as a third country. Uh, under those circumstances, um, um, what was happening, there will be additional administrative and, financial, uh, and uh, potential financial burdens potentially in relation to that, um, and that um, whereby um, that the Northern Ireland um, 
importers, uh, does your users would um, have to register as an importer. Um, there is some fees uh, with respect to that, and that um, is the fees are based on um, on a scale in terms of the amount of chemicals that are imported in, and also in terms of the hazard that they they um, they relate to. Um, but um, the, some of the one of the measures that's actually in place is that um, um, potentially if um, the supplier that the Northern Ireland company uses um, is re has a, a only registrant uh, is registered as an only representative in the EU, EU then um, that would not be applicable. There would no, wouldn't be fees would be applicable in that case. Um, so it will be up to the those who are actually bringing in the, the goods into Northern Ireland to be kind of aware of that. And to be honest, we have been um, that uh, the need to register for companies to register to. Um, for GB companies particularly to register uh, and UK companies to register with the EU to be able to trade with the EU. The, we, the guidance has been out from before the, the first um, EU exit um, uh, deadline that advising them that they needed to do that. Um, also, um, if we're in where G Northern Ireland companies are exporting um, into um, GB, um, there's new new, new We've lost you a wee bit. Notification That's scheme um, isn't um, what it means. Hello? Yes, you're back online. Hi there. I'm back online. That's great. Thank you. Um, uh, with the new notification scheme, um, Northern Ireland, um, Northern Ireland um, companies um, have to make a, a re have to notify um, the new GB reach scheme um, that they they of existing supplies that they wish to take to send into uh, GB, and that's a permanent notification, and there are no fees attached with that. Okay, so that, I mean, there, can I just ask? Uh, I know you cut out there for a bit. But has there been much consultation with firms and stakeholders in relation to the, the changes? In, in, re in relation to um, the, the recent changes that are being brought, that have been uh, agreed um, in this S uh, are included in this SI, um, there there hasn't been any specific um, engagement in Northern Ireland, but I am aware that um, in, that there has. Um, it, been, that DEFRA have coordinate have had some stakeholder engagement um, at the start of the year in February March time with stakeholders um, following the, the agreement of the Northern Ireland Protocol, and uh, we believe that in the middle of September they did some high level engagement um, with stakeholders, members of um, UK wide trade associations and NGOs, uh, and again that was following some of the announcements that was made in relation to phasing for the for the red registration um, of um, provision of, of full, full data for registration uh, and that was made, made public earlier on in the month and some of those um, engagement, um, uh, well, the results of that uh, were fairly positive in that um, they felt that the, some of the measures that were being, being put forward did seem sensible, sensible in terms of the notification process. And um, it, as I believe it was raised um, that they felt that potentially um, Northern Ireland um, it could be advantageous in that um, uh, because they, they wouldn't have to go through the full registration process to register with GB Reach if they were already registered in the EU. But there was concern that um, Northern Ireland could be used as a backdoor with companies um, using um, importing via Northern Ireland into GB. But that's what the provisions that's included in the qualifying Northern Ireland goods and uh, the new guidance that we're, ex we're expecting on highly, highly regulated goods and that we believe will will mitigate against that those possibilities. Okay. Does any of the other members have any questions or points? I was just going to ask about the consultation process <coughs> as well. And just, do you know at all? Is that consultation um, feedback in a, in a report, and we we be able to access it at all? No, it's not. It's just it is. Um, we don't have. Uh, we just have some anecdotal evidence um, from um, that we have received from our colleagues in DEFRA. Okay, and, and do you know who the stakeholders who were engaged were? Um, I'm assuming then it would be a range of business and NGOs. Um, I know you mentioned NGOs, but which ones? 
uh, as far as we're aware, again, they were UK wide yeah. um, and uh, chem chemical industry associations, um, aerospace defence sector group, um, chemical business federation, uh, cosmetics and toiletries, perfume association, uh, British codings federations, um, um, Brentag, Brentag, the Chem Trust, and the Royal Society of Chemistry. Um, so, and as I say, it's, it's quite a mixture, but it was quite a high level, a small group, and it was just to, to get some initial feedback on on what was the, what was actually already out in the public domain in terms of what was being proposed um, via the command paper and the first papers that had been released um, this year. Okay, Patsy. Patsy, are you not going to come in? That's me now, yeah. Uh, uh, thanks very much. Um, it's very difficult to absorb all this detail at once, but um, it appears there that the Department for the Economy have gone through it in quite a wee bit of detail, as um, from what I'm reading from that documentation, beg your pardon just a minute, um, DFE officials have identified a number of areas of potential concern to the Minister are, and are in the process of clarifying her position. Um, uh, are there any read across or any difficulties that have been identified by yourselves in similar types of VNs? Absolutely. We, we work very, very closely with our colleagues in the Department for Economy. Um, again, to, uh, we, we meet um, to, to at least twice a week, at the, uh, particularly in recent weeks. So we do have, we share the concerns. I think um, when initially um, some of the details were shared with us, we, we were quite concerned, um, particularly in terms of what the administrative and financial burdens were likely to be on Northern Ireland businesses. And another concern that we have had in that um, these are these are new professions as a result of the Northern Ireland Protocol that are being brought brought in for reach. But a number of these companies would also be regulated by a number of other chemical regimes, and um, our, our main concern was that there could be an accumulative effect of that. And um, these are these are new administrative um, um, measures that they're going to have to complete. They they wouldn't have had to done in the past, and and also the concern that there would be a lack of knowledge and ability maybe to to fulfil those. Um, I think as, as time has went on, her, and DEFRA have been a little bit more adapt at, adept at um, explaining how some of the processes have worked, um, that or some of our concerns have been waylaid, and we've become very aware that um, our messaging and the future communications and guidance that will be available will be critical to ensure that um, Northern Ireland companies are able to, uh, to meet these new, new requirements. So, um, we laid um, in the sense that they're parked, or we laid in the sense that they'll probably still be there, but uh, they'll come a bit clear how to deal with them. Uh, yes, I think I think that's. That's it. I think I think part of the problem was that DEFRA themselves have been have been trying to get, trying to grasp what the full implications of some of these changes actually are, and as have started to develop some scenarios as to what what uh, requirements um, would actually be be needed. Um, I think that is what that is what has maybe moved things on slightly. Yes, <coughs> red tape. Yes. <laughs> okay, right. Thank you for that. Thank you, Deputy Chair. Um, thank you. Were the Environment Agency is to provide support to the Secretary of State under Regulation 15, it may ask DERA for assistance with providing that support in relation to Northern Ireland. Could you maybe tell us um, if DERA has explored the potential impact of this on the Department and the stakeholders? I think um, within the, within um, DERA, um, obviously the operational side um, lies for the implementation at, with REACH um, lies with um, the Northern Ireland Environment Agency. Um, they have recently set up a new team, and I, and I say recently as on Monday of this week, um, to, to try and look at these. And what they, what they have said is that they will look at um, the, the new legislation as it comes out and assess what the full implications and requirements are going to be of them um, to be able to to, to meet these, and then in terms of stakeholders, then um, it will be um, we are working closely with our colleagues in the Department for Economy. And the 
the Health and Safety Executive from Northern Ireland um, to arrange um, stakeholder events in November that, uh, and again, the, the agency will be involved in, in that also to ensure that they're brought up to speed on all the new requirements. Okay, thank you. Thanks, okay. Chair. Uh, maybe get a wee update then on the other SIs. Okay. okay. Thank you, Chair. I think the uh, next of the SIs on the agenda was the uh, uh, Detergents Northern Ireland Protocol Regulations 2020, which is, uh, has been assessed as in the Category 2 um, uh, in the categorisation. So I'll hand across to uh, a colleague, Eamon Campbell, who will just take us through that broadly. Hello, Chair. Hello, committee members. I uh, hope you can hear me okay. Yep. Okay, um, just some information on the detergents regulations. Um, they will be led on the 15th of October. They've been assessed as a Category 2, uh, which means they contain substantive technical changes, but minimal policy changes. Um, they are UK-wide uh, and refer to established <coughs> systems um, that are long in place. So the references to both Scotland England and Wales, as well as Northern Ireland. Uh, their purpose is to enable uh, current legislation and policy frameworks to operate after the end of the implementation period. They will maintain regulatory standards and allow Northern Ireland to comply with EU standards as well under the Northern Ireland Protocol. Uh, the regulations will provide for continued access to the GB market also. There, they amend previously made UK regulations that were made in 2010 and 2019 in particular. Uh, some of the changes involve divisions between, and separation between GB and Northern Ireland, so you, you see references to England, Scotland and Wales being removed and so on. Um, their purpose is to ensure the free movement of goods that have been identified as Northern Ireland qualifying goods from Northern Ireland to GB. The main significant change for the department is a, a new role as a competent authority, which was previously held by the Secretary of State. Uh, one of the functions of the competent authority will be the appointment of a approved testing labs, uh, which is still to be considered. Uh, enforcement will continue as before through the local councils uh, and the environmental health services. Um, the regulation itself is uh, a UK reserve matter with enforcement being considered a devolved matter. I'm happy to take questions. Is there anybody there? Yeah. Go ahead, Rose. Yeah. Um, you talked about enforcement would be through the local councils. Yes. Um, what uh, training, etc., are you putting in place for that? Well, those systems are already in place, so I, we don't anticipate any changes to that. Okay, right. Nobody, any other questions? We'll just move on to the next one then. Thank you, Ian. Okay, thank you. Um, I think the next one on your agenda, uh, Deputy Chair, is the uh, uh, control of mercury amendment regulations, which uh, I think is one of the uh, regulations that you don't have in your packs, uh, so aren't able to formally consider. Uh, if you'd like, I think we have um, uh, Alison Jaynes on the line who can just explain uh, where we are at that particular SI, if yeah, that would be helpful to the committee. Well, before the chair takes a seat, that's okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Alison, are you online okay? I am online, yes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, Chair. Good morning. Um, just to outline the purpose of this of these regulations, um, the purpose of the Control of Mercury Amendments EU Exit Regulations 2020 is to enable its continued oper operability as retained EU law after the end of the implementation for purposes of implementing the Northern Ireland Protocol. Um, so the SI does a number of things to achieve this, and these are, the, I suppose, um, some of the key elements of it. Um, First of all, it amends um, domestic legislation, which is UK-wide, 
which is the Control of Mercury Enforcement Regulations 2017, um, to revise changes made previously by the Control of Mercury Amendment EU Exit Regulations 2019 to reinstate DERA as a competent authority with responsibility for carrying out obligations under the um, the EU regulation 2017-852, which is on mercury, which implements international obligations on mercury from the Minamata Convention. So, um, so basically, what the um, so the SI also amends the regulation itself, which being is which is being retained in EU law, being retained as EU law. So, um, the, the 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 regulation itself, or the the um, the EU exit regulation, then it revises. Um, the um, the retained EU law to apply um, um, amendments in it to to GGB only, so um, reflecting the requirements of the protocol. So what it does is introduce it applies export restrictions on mercury, mercury compounds, and mixtures of mercury um, um, to GB. It requires the consent for the import of mercury mixtures of mercury listed in Annex One of the EU regulation. Um, for allowed uses in GB, which which includes transport from Northern Ireland to GB and from GB to Northern Ireland, and um, it also makes provision for mercury waste only to move between Northern Ireland and GB for the purposes of disposal. Um, it, it it prohibits the ex export, import, and manufacture of mercury added products which are listed in Annex Two to the um, to the regulation. Um, so. The, so, so the, the effect of that is basically that um, the EU regulation in an amended form will apply in GB in relation to the import and export of mercury, and in Northern Ireland we will we will retain applying the EU regulation in its original form. Um, that said, the actual effect of this regulation of these changes on the ground we don't expect to be significant because. The approach of the EU in its regulation over the last 15 years has been to reduce and restrict the use of mercury. So the market now is very small. Um, um, DEVRA have been leading on engagement with um, with industry and with stakeholders, and um, they've indicated the UK market for mercury is small and is decreasing in size. The only a, a very small net show amount is actually moving around the UK. And that only a very small amount of imports to the UK will be affected by the new customs ar uh, arrangements with the EU. Here in Northern Ireland, we have been ringing around. We contacted chemical um, wholesalers here and the universities um, to see um, to, to try and gain some information on the use of mercury. And um, the, the wholesalers advised they basically don't import it. Um, one um, one university said they imported a small amount of mercury, and that was ten years ago. So, um, so we expect the actually impact of these amendments on the ground will be small because the use of mercury is being um, phased out through um, increased regulation because it's, it's, it's a toxic element and it is, is dangerous both to public health and to the environment. Okay, uh, thank you. That's the, the mercury. So, um, members, any? Maybe right. just one week comment yeah, here, please. So the impacts and the changes in price will be minimal, you would say, then? There are not going to be any changes? Thank you. In terms of price, I, I couldn't actually say. We have just been trying to identify, and Dara have been leading on this, and trying to actually identify really to get uh, an understanding of the, the actual use of mercury now. Um, uh, as a result of the increased regulation in terms of phasing it out. And um, so I, I couldn't actually comment on price itself. Really, we've just been trying to get basic market information on the, um, the use of mercury. The actual the biggest use of mercury actually is through dental amalgam, um, which is still used quite a lot. So that's the main use uh, in mercury. And the, the, um, the amendments being introduced don't impact on that, um, but that doesn't fall within the uh, remit of the, of DRA, it falls within the remit, remit of the Department of Health, so that's a cross-cutting issue, and um, we have consulted with the Department of Health on those, and they are aware of them. That's okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Chair. Up there, Harry? Yep. Okay, then. Uh, okay, so uh, we can move on then to the next one. 
um, some oral evidence on the uh, o the SI DAFRA ODS of three ozone depleting substances and fluorinated ga um, greenhouse gases. It's a category two. Um, it was this SI was received late on Tuesday. Uh, it's found at page table at page thirty of the tabled papers. Um, the DRO officials have already briefed uh, members on this essay. Um, so, can I ask? Um, they haven't. They need to. Sorry? They need to brief. They haven't. Well, they haven't. Sorry. Yeah. Um, so, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. My mistake. You haven't briefed. So, <coughs> this opportunity to to uh, brief the members on this particular essay. Thank you, Chair. I, I'll just hand across to Colin Nugent, who's the policy lead on this SI, to give a quick brief on that. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Good morning, Chair. Good morning, committee members and colleagues on the line. Uh, the ODS03 uh, SI, as you've just mentioned, is a UK-wide SI designed to uh, correct deficiencies in the Northern Ireland Protocol concerning uh, two EU pieces of law, one relating to fluorinated greenhouse gases, or F gases, and the other relating to ozone depleting substances, or ODS. Uh, the F gases are largely used in products such as firefighting equipment, refrigeration, air conditioning, and are quite widespread in uh, our market. Ozone depleting substances have been phased out over the course of many years. Uh, both of these are dealt with under the Montreal Protocol from the UN, where phasing out has been going on for quite some time. So the only use of ODF in Northern Ireland at the moment relates to laboratory use at some of our universities. Uh, the SI ensures that the EU law is retained in Northern Ireland law with respect to these uh, work areas. Uh, it does not amount to a significant policy change in that regard. Uh, as Northern Ireland will continue to stay in the EU system. It does create provisions that allow GB, uh, Great Britain, to create its own system for monitoring and regulating uh, those substances. And uh, it's due to be laid at Westminster on 13th of October and has been categorised as Category 2. Okay. Thank you, John. Very quick one, Chair. I, I can see the procedural aspect of this, but, but I'm keen to know that when these are being considered by DEFRA or Bidera, um, uh, uh, is, is it considered automatically the, the contribution any of this would make to the overall greenhouse gas picture and targets to reduce those? Um, uh, and are uh, recommendations made on that basis or, and are those matters taken into consideration? Yes, the, the SI is designed to ensure that the UK continues to meet its obligations under the UN Montreal Protocol, which is designed to phase out the use of these fluorinated greenhouse gases and ozone depleting substances by 2030. So, uh, laying this SI will ensure that we continue to do that. It will also ensure that uh, we continue to abide by all the principles of the Montreal Protocol and ensure that our climate ambitions set out in the 2008 UK Climate Act uh, continue to be met. Okay, thank you. Okay. Okay, um, thank you. Well, we'll move on then to the, the, the SI DEFRA CHM07 Persistent Organic Pollutants Amendment. Um, that's a, it's a category one. Uh, it's in the table pack at number eleven, and page sixteen on the main on the main pack. Is there any um, comments uh, officials want to make in relation to that one, or questions from members? Okay. 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 So we'll can move on then to the SI DEFRA PES 07, the Pesticides Amendment to EU Exit Regulations. It's a category two. Um, it's in the pack page twenty four, table pack page twelve. Um, any comments from officials or members on this one? Okay. And SA DEFRA AQ04, the air quality uh, NA protocol regulations. We uh, we have no uh, details of the category, and we don't have any pa particular papers received. Any pa any papers received? Uh, is there any? Commentary around that, that one we touched on previously. Chair, yes. um, so I can uh, 
that's a, uh, an SI where there's still some discussions uh, with DEFRA about the laying date and the final detail of the regulation. If it would help the committee, um, I think Colin is the policy lead on that and could give an overview of broadly what the SI is, uh, is aiming to do, that would be helpful. Yeah, members, uh, yeah, if that's possible, yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you, Colin. Thank you, Dave. Um, certainly, I can do that briefly for you. The reason you haven't had any papers or seen side of the SI is because we've only just received it quite recently ourselves, and uh, the submission has not yet been prepared for the minister. But I believe that is that is underway. But to give you a brief overview, it, it again it's another NI protocol related SI, and it ensures that two particular pieces of EU legislation are retained in NI law. Uh, the first one is a regulation relating to volatile organic compounds, in particular emissions from paint and varnish products. So it's a, it's a market access standard that ensures there are certain emission standards for paints and varnishes on the market in the EU. And the second element relates to the industrial emissions directive, in particular uh, the best available techniques that are applied to regulating emissions from certain uh, industries and this one relates to uh, waste incineration uh, uh, because uh, the industrial emissions directive is listed as annex 4 of the northern Ireland protocol so uh, for any uh, industrial uh, systems that are related to the regulation of the single energy market so for any waste incineration plant in northern ireland that uh, are linked to the single energy market there will be eu standards in place uh, to regulate emissions from that so really this SI ensures that those pieces of EU law are retained in Northern Ireland, Northern Ireland law in context of the protocol. Okay. I was content with that. Sure. Okay. So um, we'll just now look at the, uh, the committee consideration of these, these chemical SIs that we've got an overview of. Um, again, it's uh, uh, table papers 15. Um, uh, the first one is the, the REACH etc. amendment, EU Exit Regulations Category 3. Um, uh, this, this SA will result in complex changes with an impact on this jurisdiction. There's also a crossover with the Department of the Economy, um, and the officials have already briefed the members on this SA. Um, so uh, i just go up with the question, you know, is the committee uh, content for the dear Minister to give consent for the uh, UK Minister to lay this essay in the uh, UK Parliament and or to outlet any comments or issues that it wishes to draw from the of the Minister. What's the view? Chairman, I'm content that the Minister it is. It was consent. Okay. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so I want to uh, talk. Uh, so SI DEFRA DET 03, D the detergents, uh, table paper 26. Dear officials have briefed us on this F SI. Um, so is the committee content for the dear minister to give consent for the UK minister to lay this SI in the uh, Westminster of the UK Parliament and uh, or to outline any comments or issues that wish to draw the attention of the minister? Content, Chair. Okay, thank you. Um, so just for clarity then, do I...? Yeah, the same way, yeah. Okay, uh, again, I'm going to ask the same question in relation to SI Defra CHM 12, Control of Mercury. Um, members content for...? No, 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 no papers. Sorry, we don't have papers in relation to this one. Sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, chair. Sorry, Patsy, Hello. go ahead. Yes, Patsy. Sorry, Chair, I've been, I've been trying to get in there. Oh, sorry. Um, well, you can see me, the elevated hand that owners of technology. Oh, sorry. Um, just, um, um, I'm just I'm going through these. I'm not going to over these points, but I just want to make the points about uh, the, the first one there. Um, clearly, there, there are problems and difficulties over DFE with, with that reach issue. Now, I'm from my own personal point of view, um, just I would like to say I want to note these because we haven't had proper time to scrutinize them. Um, that's my personal viewpoint uh, because uh, just the detail isn't there, to be frank with you, and uh, I'm uncomfortable with that. Okay, thank you. 
The Chair, I think it's really important to have it on record that we haven't had scrutiny time, um, that we've had brief briefings um, and the detail and the implications of any of these um, has not been good pro good pro uh, um, just good practice here. So it's yeah. Maybe just to be noted and to let the Minister know, sorry. Yeah. Oh. I was just going to, you know, we kind of took a position last week where we yeah. had a form of words that we all seem content with. Maybe we should just revert back because, I mean, the point has been made by Patsy there that, you know, we got this late, there is concerns about them and there's a lack of information. Sorry, if I could say, Chair, to some of those concerns that at the, um, where there's dual responsibility uh, between the DERA and uh, DFE, where there seem to be concerns about the, the REACH issue. Now, I don't know what those are, but clearly there are concerns. Um, so, um, uh, no, I, I think to, to say what Philip was, we were all comfortable with the position we took last week, and um, especially where, where there are concerns of another department, I wouldn't really want us to be walking into something there. Um, but. We did have a consistent position last week, and I just suggest we continue on with it. Thank you. See, in relation to the REACH one, has the officials any indication of what the the Department of Economy's concerns are? Um, well, yeah, Chair, so I, um, I think it, it's, it's broad in relation to the uh, the point that's been made about a, a, a number of the, uh, the SIs in terms of the whilst the uh, uh, SIs themselves may make uh, relatively minor technical changes, uh, the, the, the actual facts of the, uh, the protocol, meaning that uh, Northern Ireland is operating within the EU regime and Britain is operating what will be a separate regime and therefore potentially additional cost to, to business, depending on how the uh, interpretation of some of those uh, um, uh, terms in, in the protocol uh, around uh, uh, unfettered access uh, and Northern Ireland qualifying, qualifying goods, FMA regulated goods uh, taken forward. I, I think the uh, both the Minister for the Economy and uh, our Minister have written to DEFRA, uh, Secretary of State, uh, the different, different Minister, to, to, to just outline those concerns. But maybe Caroline is there anything more specific we can say on that? I think just, just to reiterate, I think um, I think the biggest concern that everyone has is because if um, Northern Ireland businesses um, want to uh, operate in the GB, they will have to register not only with the, the EU, EU system but with the GB system. But that's going to be the same equally for GB um, companies wanting to um, operate in both both jurisdictions. They'll have to register with both the EU reach and GB reach. So I think that's the primary concern. Also, um, in relation to as mentioned the the effect that northern other and downstream users become importers um, that that is a concern and um, it's it's they're generally in around those types of issues as mm -hmm. well and the fact that um, a distinction is made between um, Northern Ireland and GB uh, which which is obviously a necessity because of the Northern Ireland protocol Chair, can I just add to that as well that we were discussing the the consultation process that has happened particularly on reach and there's been no consultation really with NI bodies on that one. It has been a DEFRA led consultation with GB organisations. I think that's something worth noting. There's reference to qualifying goods as well, we're not the definition of that either. Okay, so um, is this one maybe one note then? Well, I mean, but just by Patsy's interjection, I mean, I would suggest that we use the form of words that we used last week in relation to it. People are happy with that. No, no, we're not content, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so again, the come back again. That, so we note that one. The DEFRA DET the T03 detergent one. Can we content to note this one as well? Yeah. Okay, uh, the controller Mercury. Um, well, we don't have any paper, we can't make any decision on that one there. Um, the uh, SI DEFRA ODS 03 ozone depleting substances and fluorinated gas, greenhouse gases, uh, again was received late. Can we, um, the dear has already briefed the members on it. Again, are we content to note this one as well? Yeah. Okay, uh, the uh, oral, oral uh, session um, 
SIDAFRA CHM 07, the Persistent Organic Pollutants Amendment, EU Act Regulations, Carry 1. That's page 17 to 23 of your packs and table papers 35, which explains why the category SIA1 has changed from a category 1 to a category 2. The officials have already briefed members on this SA and are we content to note it? Okay. Okay, the uh, oral evidence session, dear, uh, at DEFRA at PSO7, the Pesticides Amendment EU Act Regulation 2020, Category 2. Correspondent of the Department is at page 25 to 30 of your packs. The officials have briefed the members on this. Uh, are the committee content to note this? Mm -hmm. Okay, and the Air Quality um, um, NA Protocol Regulation 2020. We don't have any uh, papers. Uh, Relating to this essay, and we we can't consider this one. Um, we'll now move to consider the uh, third group, um, which is agricultural uh, stroke uh, miscellaneous. This includes the SA DEFRA agricultural products, food and drink, SA DEFRA common organisation of the markets and agricultural products, and DEFRA AG 26, the genetically modified um, organism <coughs> regulation 2020. Uh, again, members will note that as of 6 p.m. yesterday, no papers have been received from the uh, SA DEFRA FD06 Agriculture Products, Food and Drink Amendments, and for DEFRA CMO18, the Common Organisation of the Markets and Agriculture Products. I'd like to welcome John uh, Mills, Head of Environment Policy, Ken Bradley, uh, Regulatory Resources Policy Branch, and Liam McCrory, Head of Brexit. And again, I suppose at the outset, before you give your presentation, I'd like if you could explain why two of the SAs that we were expecting have not been provided, if the Minister intends to give consent to it being laid. Thank you. Uh, Chair, it's Elaine McCrory here. Um, oh, if I could start off, perhaps. Yeah. Can, can you hear me okay? Yeah, perfectly. Elaine, yeah. yeah. Okay, Th thanks for the opportunity to come present on these two SIs today. Um, apologies that I haven't been able to share the papers with the committee at this stage. The main reason for that is that I haven't obtained all the necessary clearances to share those papers. I am hopeful that I'll be able to share them later this week and, and obviously I'd be happy to take any questions on them when you do receive them so that, that we can help the committee's consideration. If it's useful, I can give a bit of a brief overview of, of what's in some of these two SIs. Yeah, that'd be helpful, I think, yeah. Would, would that be helpful, yes? Yeah, yeah. Uh, if you take a few minutes, I'll give an overview on, on all of their, their main uh, um, their SIs in the group. Yeah, that would be helpful, yeah. Just a brief overview would be helpful, yes. Okay, I, I can only cover the, the two SIs that the... the DEFRA FD06 and the DEFRA CMO18, and then it would be over to, to John's team to cover the other one. Okay. Okay. Um, if, if I give you a brief overview of what, what's in my two, and then yeah. perhaps if you have any immediate questions, I could deal with those. Okay. So, first of all, um, the first one is the Agricultural Products, Food and Drink Amendment, etc., EU Exit Regulations 2020. Um, I'll just call it FD06 because it's such a mouthful. So DEFRA is proposing to make this legislation on a UK-wide basis to ensure a functioning statute book at the end of the transition period. It's planning to lay this SI on the 14th of October. And we had originally categorised this particular SI as a Category 3. And that was because we hadn't seen a full um, set of papers for the SI and there were some outstanding issues that we needed to discuss around the operation of the SI but having looked at it in detail now we're fairly certain it's a, a category 2 SI so it makes some policy changes but, but nothing that will affect uh, Northern Ireland substantially however it's obviously up to the committee to, to consider that when they get the paper so basically this SI deals with geographical indication schemes as well as wines, aromatised wines and spirit drink sector standards. It revokes and reinstates a number of previous SIs and updates them as well where, where necessary. And it consolidates all those previous SIs into one document. Now about 85% of this SI 
deals with GIs, geographical indications, and those are a reserved matter because they are a form of intellectual property right. It also provides the basis for UK schemes to be created, which will operate in GB. And this is necessary for the UK to fulfil some of its obligations <laughs> under WTO rules. Now, because the, the GI legislation is included in Annex 2 of the protocol, Northern Ireland will continue to follow the EU rules on GIs. So a large part of the SI basically strips Northern Ireland out and makes it clear that the new rules and new schemes apply to protection of products in GB. And then Northern Ireland will continue to follow the EU scheme rules instead. So despite the fact that these are reserved matters, we have worked very closely with DEFRA on developing the new UK schemes and also in developing new UK logos for the schemes, which have just been recently published. And, and we'll continue to work with them as, as they, you know, finalise the detail of the arrangements for these new schemes. So the next thing that the, the, the is, as I said, it amends and um, makes operability amendments in relation to wine, aromatised wines and spirit drinks. And again, these, these matters are included in Annex 2 of the protocol. So Northern Ireland will continue to align with the EU rules while in GB, they will follow their own retained EU rules instead. The final thing that the, the SI does is it amends the domestic enforcement legislation for GIs and also these wines and spirit drink standards. And because GB will follow retained EU and Northern Ireland will follow EU directly, we needed some parallel amendments to be made to the UK-wide enforcement regs to make that clear, that Northern Ireland will continue to enforce EU rules in these areas. So th those are the main changes that are made by this SI. As I said, the vast majority of it relates to reserve matters. And there's only a very small amount that would uh, relate to domestic legislation here in Northern Ireland. And I, I don't think that um, certainly existing GI holders will not notice any difference as a result of this SI, because they'll continue to enjoy protection in both GB and the EU. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. Julian, that was very helpful. Um, okay, uh, Elaine, just for clarity, that, you, 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 what, you, what you spoke to there was the uh, the FD06, right? It was FD06, that's the GI one. Yeah, and... If well, it's helpful, I can move on, or I'm happy to take any questions. Yeah, yeah I'd be happy to just, just move on then, and take questions we can we can ask at the end of them, Elaine. Are you, are you okay. covering the CMO18 and the AG26 as well? I'm just covering the CMO18 one. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So th this one here, CMO18, uh, to give it its full title, the Common Organisation of the... Elaine, you've lost your. Hello, Elaine, we've lost you. I'm not going to lost you now, Elaine. Go oh, Ian. Sorry, sorry. Um, I, I, I read out the full title of the SI there. Can That's you hear okay. me now? Yeah, okay. So CMO18? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll just call it that because it's easier. So it's, it's one of two SIs which will amend legislation in relation to common market organisation marketing standards and organic production and labelling. So along with the other, the reserved SI, it amends a number of retained EU regulations and also domestic secondary legislation, as well as uh, previous SIs that were made in preparation for a, a no deal exit. And it's needed to make sure that the law works properly in GB after the transition period, and it corrects previous errors and inconsistencies. And the, the main thing that it does is to implement the Northern Ireland Protocol. So a lot of the changes really in this SI are technical amendments. And what it does is, because Northern Ireland follows um, 
the urines, it removes Northern Ireland from the previous exit size in that respect. So I think there are about 80 changes where it changes a uh, member state or a council or a commission um, to Great Britain. And then there are also a lot of other changes, again, where it changes community or union to Great Britain. So that, that's the vast majority of the changes. It also makes sure that any legislative and decision-making powers that are repatriated from the Commission to the UK apply to GB only, because Northern Ireland will continue to follow the EU rules on marketing standards. And that means that, that we don't have regulation making powers to change the marketing standards. The same thing applies with um, the organic production and labor there, where it makes it clear that Northern Ireland and DERA doesn't legislate in those areas, it will still be the Commission. So those are the bulk of the changes in, in this particular SI. There are other changes in the SI that unfortunately I am not at liberty to talk about at the moment because um, the UK government is probably going to make an announcement on those things um, at the timing of that's not clear. So I'm, I'm not at liberty to, to share those with you at this stage and I apologise for that but I'm just, I'm just not able to do it. So I'm happy to take any questions from the committee. Um, this particular one, this second SI, will be laid on the 15th of October. Okay. Um, what I might do, if I might okay, is take the AG26 one as well and then we can ask questions yeah. off the off. Of, <laughs> is that okay? Um, okay. Uh, okay. Um, could I ask then now, um, in relation to the, the AG26 genetically modified uh, organisms Amendment Regulation 2020, it's 39 to 44 in your pack. Um, the, um, so we, we've been briefing this one before. So has uh, members any questions that they want to ask Elaine or any of the members of those three? It's the SI DARFA FD06, the agriculture products one, the CMO18 Common Market Organisation and the AG2016 Idly Modified Organisms. Is there any questions anybody wants to ask in relation to those three before we put? Okay. So, can I ask the question? Is the committee uh, content to note the, those those three uh, uh, essays? Okay. Chair, can I just say on that one? I mean, there's those two that the officials um, are saying haven't they haven't got the necessary clearance to give us details yeah. on, and they are not at liberty to give us further information on. But both of them are classed as. Category three, yeah. um, and I think that this is a wee bit more than just mm. noting them. Yeah. You know, uh, we're being asked to do something with these when they mm. haven't been laid, when they have big policy changes, and when um, officials are not cleared to give us details on it. So how can we even note them? Can't note them. Uh, Can't. I don't think, Mr. Chairman, noting. Them. We're okay. only noting them. There's nothing wrong with noting something. But we haven't seen them. Or even you never seen them. <laughs> well, I mean, you have. We were told that they're mainly technical. Um, yeah, I well, when's the earliest possible? When's the earliest chance we will be able to get uh, sight of the information okay. which we currently don't have? The, the first one, the FD06. I hope that you you get that today or tomorrow. And um, I think it's, it's just a, a technicality that we haven't got it released yet. Also, I would say that one is having looked at it again. I would say that's a category two SI because it's it's mainly technical changes. And it's eighty-five percent reserved. So, so that one you should get very quickly. The second one, the one that which has some content, and I can't. Sure. Yeah. Is that released? Um, and hopefully, again, it will be this week. Yeah. Well, does the does committee want to? Withhold any decision until we get that information. I think, Chair, Chair, I mean, yeah, I think that that's the best thing to do. We've um, <clears throat> two sets of papers that we haven't received. Um, the third on uh, AG Twenty Six, which tells me that no consultation took place. Now I understand the rationale for that in, in, in the paper, and there are papers available for that one in front of me. But can I ask more generally? 
Is there an argument that there should be consultation even within the sector or, or various sectors, if that's applicable, given the unique circumstances of Northern Ireland with, it, with an EU interface that, that doesn't apply across the rest of the UK? And has that been considered? Chair, could I clarify on AG26? Yeah, mm -hmm. Tonight, we'll fight organisms, yeah. Uh, sorry, Ken Bradley, you probably maybe can't see me. Oh, uh, can, yes. But, oh, can you? Good. <laughs> on AG26, uh, on the question of consultation, there was no formal consultation by DEFRA, um, no general consultation, but there was specific uh, consultation by them with biotechnical companies, universities, right. NGOs. <laughs> it's, it's a very limited uh, yeah. sphere, very limited you know, issue. And so the companies that were relevant to this were, were contacted. There, there are no policy changes. They're, they're totally technical. And therefore, because there are no policy changes, there was a, a feeling that the, uh, a consultation wasn't required. OK, thank you. Philip? I, mean, I was going to make this point in closed session later, but it's probably the most appropriate point to make it now. Just in relation to us discussing things today where we don't have papers uh, and then the potential for us maybe having to discuss them again. I mean, can, can the committee, is the committee at liberty to actually say that we don't have papers, we actually don't discuss it or make a decision Sense. on it until we actually get papers? Okay. I, mean, I mean, I think we, we, we've literally, I'm not saying we've wasted an hour, but we've spent an, uh, potentially an hour, an hour and a half this morning going through these SIs where we don't have papers, we don't have all the up-to-date information, and we've been asked to make a decision on them, or alternatively, we'll be asked to discuss them again, uh, maybe in a week's time at the next committee meeting when we have them. So, I mean, if, it's, if we are uh, okay to do it, I would actually make the proposal that when we don't have papers, we literally don't discuss it until we have papers. Okay. Yep, I think that's, that, that's an acceptable position. Yep. Perfectly reasonable position. Okay, Okay. so there's no papers received uh, in relation to the CMO 18, the FDO 6. Um, there are some, uh, there's, there's some cars that are So we, like, we, don't, we, we don't make a decision until we get more information. Okay. Okay, right. Egypt, uh, AG, AG26, you're content to note. Why, well, sorry, sorry, AG26, the Tenelli modified organism. John, you had asked a question about that there, so content to note that one, okay? Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Uh, so, item 18 on the agenda, um, number 18, is the oral evidence from DERA. It's a general trade update, and there's a, a written update from the department at page uh, 46 to 47. I'd like to welcome uh, Seamus McLean, Dara Chief Economist, Mark McLean, um, the uh, Principal Agriculture Economist, and I'd like to um, invite the officials to brief the committee on this uh, the trade update. Hi, Chair. It's uh, Seamus McLean here. Um, if you're content, I'll make some introductory comments on the paper. Um, Start with saying that um, trade is a trade policy is not a devolved matter; it's a reserved one. Uh, but obviously, trade impacts on the DAs, and uh, it's something we take keen interest in and try to influence. The UK is engaged in a number of trade negotiations. Um, ongoing negotiations are taking place with the EU, the US. Australia and New Zealand. A trade deal has already been concluded with Japan and I'll give a brief update on all of those. I'll also cover trade continuity negotiations aimed at rolling over existing EU trade deals so that existing preferential trading arrangements with a range of countries remain available to UK exporters. And finally, I'll say something about uh, the UK global tariff policy, which sets tariffs for countries with which the UK doesn't have a free trade agreement. So in terms of the ongoing negotiations, I'll start with the EU. Um, the ninth round of negotiations was completed last week. 
Both sides remain very ambitious for a zero tariff, zero quota deal, though there are some issues where the positions remain fairly far apart. But engagement in the negotiations, we are told, has been extremely positive and both sides are striving to find a suitable landing zone that might uh, allow a deal to be struck. Just recently, the Prime Minister and the EU Commission President agreed to intensify the talks uh, with a view to reaching a deal by the end of this month. So the main areas of contention remaining are around level playing field and also access to UK waters for EU fishing boats. Um, if I turn to the EU negotiations, um, there have been four rounds. Um, basically, those rounds are very much about setting out opening positions. Uh, they have been described as very constructive. Um, there's likely to be another round before the US presidential election. And that, you know, I think a change in president could see a change in the emphasis in these negotiations. But either way, we expect the US. Uh, to push the UK for a change in standards that would allow US product into the UK. Trade negotiations are ongoing with Australia and New Zealand. Um, these are also at very early stages with only one or two rounds have been, have been completed so far, but the pace of these is likely to increase over the next few months. Standards isn't quite such a big issue with Australia and New Zealand, but obviously we have defensive interests um, in relation to both those countries and indeed America. Um, our defensive interests with respect to America are mainly around beef and poultry, and with respect to Australia, they're around beef and sheep. And in relation to New Zealand, our defensive interests are around dairy and sheep. Moving on then, the UK-Japan Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement was agreed on 11 September. Essentially, this is a rollover of the EU-Japan trade deal with some additional benefits, including recognition of Northern Ireland GIs such as Rockne Eels and Armagh Bramleys. The deal sees some tariff reductions in pork, beef and salmon, as well as a few other food products. And these should offer opportunities for local exporters. But we haven't received the full detail of the Japan deal just yet, although we expect that to be shared with us quite soon. Um, if we turn then to the trade continuity negotiations, um, Good progress has been made here, uh, with agreement having been secured with a number of countries, including South Africa, South Korea, and Switzerland, to name a few. And there's also then very high expectation that we can conclude trade continuity negotiations with Canada and Turkey before the end of the year, and also the EFTA countries. But there's a few countries where difficulties remain, particularly Mexico and Algeria. So finally, I want to just mention the UK's global tariff policy, which came out earlier this year. And that is the tariff, they set out in that policy, the tariffs that will apply to all the countries that the UK trades with, but doesn't have an FTA with them. Um, essentially, the UK has taken the EU's tariff schedule and uh, adapted it slightly. So what they've done is they've removed some of the very small tariffs completely and they have rounded some of the others down slightly. But effectively, this schedule provides much the same level of protection to local producers um, that they currently um, have under new arrangements. So I think I can finish there and Mark McLean himself can uh, take any questions that you may have. Thanks a lot, Chair. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Seamus. Um, I suppose uh, one thing um, last um, 
Say in relation to the any prospective deals with the USA and other uh, countries, um, they they won't be they won't be one way. It won't just be a case that we'll be exporting. What what, what would be the trade off? What, what what would we be expecting in return? Because obviously, it's a very um, open fear amongst farmers um, here and indeed across in Britain of the prospect of them having to contend with. Uh, um, food coming in from other countries that is of um, perhaps a, a lower environmental or um, welfare standards than the produce we have here. So, any assessment of what what's the the quid pro quo effectively? What 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 may there be in return uh, for us accessing uh, markets? Yeah, I think in all trade negotiations. Both sides have offensive and defensive interests. You know, they have domestic industries that they want to continue to protect. <coughs> and in our case, you know, agriculture, a lot of agricultural products um, have a sort of special status in, in trade negotiations where we want to continue to provide protection through a tariff barrier. But we also would have offensive interests, you know. Um, Dairy products, for example, in, in the case of the United States, we feel we could probably get more dairy products into the to the US. But as you say, in order in order to get access in, in one area, you might need to um, give on another area. So there's always give and take in these negotiations, and, and it's difficult to know where the landing zone will be often. Um, but all of these have to be weighed up. I don't know whether Mark wants to add anything there. Um, okay. Now, you said in, in your written report that an agreement needs to be reached by mid October. How confident um, you know, are, are yourselves? Indeed, how, what, how confident is, is the UK or the EU in relation to that deadline? It's, it's a difficult question, you know, and obviously we keep asking them that question ourselves, but to be fair, it's a difficult question for them to answer. I mean, the outcome of negotiations is, is, is unknown and it just takes time to get there. I think both parties have sort of committed to uh, try and get a deal during this month, whether it's achieved before the 15th is... It's not easy to say, but uh, they might give it a few more days after that, possibly. Um, I think all we can say is that both parties are really committed in trying to achieve a deal, um, but it's just difficult to say. And we've asked them this question, and you know, to be fair, they're saying it's a wee bit unfair because we, we can't, can't predict how the negotiations will go. But both sides are certainly very focused in trying to achieve a deal. Okay. Um. Thank you. Um, and I suppose before we move around, it this probably would be relevant to note and, and welcome. You know, if there's a couple, uh, I think it was two, two processing factories in uh, County Derry up in Korean that have succeeded in getting access to export their beef to the US market, which mm -hmm. is uh, good news to be <coughs> here. I'm going to move around the room, Rosemary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your. Uh, presentation. Uh, I notice, notice there in your trade update, you talk about the UK has negotiated a deal that sees tariffs fall on pork, beef and salmon, etc. And you said further details of the agreement are awaited and more work is required to finalise. What do you mean by that? Well, I suppose um, a trade negotiations are complex uh, process. Um, there's lots of discussion happens and then they put together a text uh, around which they can uh, agree. And the text put together in, in, in an early stage, but it has to go through the sort of law has to go through lawyers so that it's you know the text is sort of legally signed. So although they've reached an agreement on what they want the deal to look like the actual text still has to you know go through the legal procedures that make it sound if you like and then there's still um both countries would have to um, agree the text at the political level uh, through their parliaments so there's various stages to go through although they have 
found an agreement that they're both sides are content with still has to be put into legal text and then signed off by both countries through their political system. Okay. No, I, I was thinking on maybe that there were further further deals that were in the offing, such as maybe other products. That's where I was coming from. Yeah, I, I don't think so. There, you know, there could be still some details to sort out, but I would imagine, you know, they're, they're mostly technical issues. So I would think, um, you know, they've reached their deal on, on what products tariffs are going to be reduced on. Okay. Rosemary, Claire. Thanks, Chair. Um, and thanks for that. I'm just. Um, a quick one, really, but are, are, are DERA and the department and the officials happy with the level of engagement with them by the by DEFRA um, and on any progress and discussions that are happening here, and particularly with non-EU countries? And do you have any concerns about the level of input of the devolved administrations into the negotiations um, and any potential impacts on that as well? Yeah, I mean, obviously, uh, UK are in the driving seat um, we're not in the negotiating room um, DEFRA are our opposite number uh, and they lead on some aspects with respect to trade specifically SPS and animal welfare and issues like that and often you know our stakeholders are most concerned about tariffs and uh, it's DIT, as part of for international trade, that lead on that side, along with their counterparts in Treasury. Um, so uh, we have good regular engagement with DEFRA on SBS issues. And DEFRA are engaged with DIT on issues around tariffs, and TRQs, etc. And why we you know, we get good engagement with DEFRA on SPS issues. We feel they could be a little bit more open with us in terms of maybe analysis they're doing to support their position and their discussions with DIT around tariffs. So some frustration remains there. Although, to be fair, um, our colleagues in DFE lead on trade more widely uh, on behalf of Northern Ireland and they have good contacts with DIT and we do get invited to some of their briefing sessions with DIT which is helpful and allows us to raise questions about tariffs etc. So it's always a mixed bag um, to be fair. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, John? Uh, thanks Chair, I'm grateful for the, the detail that, that's in the report and, and the presentation as well but Keen also to try, if we can, to put some portion on this, because whilst there, there's good news in there, and it, it's really good to see that um, Loch Neil, Eels and Bramley Apples uh, from Armagh are making the cut, as it were, in, in international trade, and that, that's a good thing. But these are, when I say it respectfully, quite bespoke or unique products. Um, and some of the, the trade deals forthcoming as well are, are limited in, in proportion and progress, I would say. So would it be possible to have this set in the context of what, what's being presented here in comparison to existing trade with the EU so that we have some proportion around this and so that we know the limits that are built in as well? Um, and and the, the, the deal with Japan, for example, which is still progressing, you could argue, and not, not in any way a direct replacement for what exists currently in EU trade, I would imagine. Is that a fair comment? I think, I think there's, yeah. Um, it's, it's obvious that, you know, you're going to trade more with your closest geographical uh, partners or countries that are close to you. Um, obviously, it's difficult to, to trade when the country is the other side of the world. Um, you can certainly trade commodities around the world, like sides of beef, for example, but uh, if you're going to trade um, high 
priced cuts of beef, you know, um, that are almost ready to go into the retail chain, it's much more difficult to trade over long distances. So you always value that uh, good trading arrangements with your closest um, countries. Mm -hmm. Hey, Chair, maybe if I could just come in here. Uh, it's just important to be clear, the, the UK-Japan free trade agreement that is still being finalised is very much modelled on the existing EU-Japan free trade agreement. There are some tweaks to it that have been outlined there and we're awaiting some more, more details on those, on, on the changes. But given the timescales that were available, it really wouldn't have been possible to have agreed anything else in the immediate future, other than something that was quite close to what was already in place with the EU. Australia, New Zealand and the United States trade ne negotiations, those would be different to what is there already because none of those countries have a trade agreement with the EU, although Australia and New Zealand are in negotiations with the EU on a free trade agreement. And, you know, it remains to be seen whether any, you know, those negotiations will reach a, a conclusion. And if they do reach a conclusion, just maybe how different the UK agreement is with Australia and New Zealand and the uh, EU agreement is with Australia and New Zealand. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you for that. Uh, see, j j uh, and, um, forgive me if this is um, beyond your remit to answer, but just uh, when I was looking at the official recognition for the Lockney Eels and the Downey Apples, which is just great news, um, are you, um, have you any update or have you any, are you aware of where the, um, the possibility of us having a joint bid with the South of Ireland for PGA status for the beef? And I've spoken informally to a board bay about this, but are you aware of where that's at at the moment the, for the PGA status? Yeah, I, th I think you're, you're is, it, is it grass fed beef? Yes, yeah, Irish grass fed beef, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know an awful lot about that. I know there has been discussions about it, and you know, um, but uh, to be fair, I would have to take your question away and get and get uh, it's probably unfair someone that. else to provide an answer. I, I yeah. don't know off the top of my head. I know, but I just was just was asking because when I seen the official status, uh, just that just reminded me of it. But th that that's fine. I'm something re I'll be raising the minister shortly again. Anyhow, uh, William. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for your presentation and. I live in the heart of the Bramley Apple Company, so I welcome the fact that the, the special re official recognition of both the Lockney Ale and the Bramley Apple. But in relation, I think the main concern, I suppose, on all these trade deals from, from many of say, in Northern Ireland agriculture is we produce food to a very high standard. Most of them, Northern Ireland agriculture now is red tractor, and imports coming in that have that are not to the same standard is a concern. And, uh, there are concerns, I think, widespread, and even in as I've seen in the House of Lords and the Committee in the House of Lords, that concerns the same issue. Um, that, that could be a very major issue for Northern Ireland agriculture. Yes, uh, I think our Minister is very keen that standards are maintained and we don't see a, a lowering of standards. And I think there's a lot of public support for that um, as well. So uh, I think our UK counterparts on, on trade issues assure us that you know, you know, they, they want to hold a strong line on standards um, as well. And obviously, you don't want to see a lowering standards, and also you do want some tariff protection for some uh, vulnerable, more vulnerable sectors. And there is, as you say, when we're doing deals with different countries, there's a cumulative effect across these deals. Um, you know, if they all give a little bit more access, well, the cumulative impact of that builds up. So all of these issues are, are very much being discussed and uh, we're trying to influence the UK position on all of those issues. Okay, right. uh, okay thank you. Um, I suppose the standards issue is very important, obviously. <coughs> It's been ideal if I had to have an amendment in the, uh, in the agriculture bill, but I will say that there's a, uh, um, there's a strong voice from here in, in uh, Victor Chestnut and the, in the Anders Commission, so 
hopefully that will have some impact in terms of protecting uh, what we have here. So I'd like to take this opportunity of uh, thank sorry, sorry Morris, Morris, you have your hand up, sorry that Morris, can you come in there and phone? Yeah. Sorry, Mark. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, listen, you alluded to the 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 yes, there uh, and then Korean, but also um, um, for the food and brand on the Yan. The food news came in nineteen nineties to about the market. That's very good food. But uh, I like to thank Seamus for I think being one of the very few people that have come to the committee and give us a positive <laughs> feedback. But what I would like. Don't see anything. Uh, uh, or was this thing in a really good pause here? Is that uh, could they give us some sort of information when they get it, asking to how and when the existing trade deals are going to be implemented, and when future trade deals and the negotiations with come with Europe? How they will need some information to make our own assessments as a case. If we can have some information, I think that's the vital part. We're not getting enough information. I got up okay, up okay Seamus? Yeah, I, 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 I it was broke up a little bit, but I, I think I got the gist of it that you know you'd be keen to have updates as, as, and information to be yeah. passed on as soon as we, we can do it. Um, I, I think we do provide a regular trade update to the committee. I'm not sure how often that happens, but um, you know we'd like to keep you informed and, and we're happy to do that. Okay. Yeah, if I, Chair, if I could just uh, add to that, um, like the, the continuity trade agreements, which are agreements that the UK is seeking to put in place that the EU already has with various countries and currently apply to the UK, the intention would be for those all to come into effect on the 1st of January 2021, whenever the transition period... Whenever the the transition period ends. Um, as regards the EU trade agreement, again, the intention would be if one's reached for it to come into effect on the 1st of January 2021. The United States, Australia and New Zealand, well, that's uncertain because, you know, those will depend when the negotiations conclude and the legal tax gets agreed and ratified and so on. But, you know, I'd have to say that, you know, it, it would it'll be some time after the end of 2020 that, you know, that's going to be possible. Okay. I just add to that, I mean, don't want you to get an impression because the Japan deal was done so quickly that the others will follow very quickly afterwards because as Mark has already pointed out, you know, there's quite a difference in the starting points. Um, Japan already had a deal with the EU, so it's more a case of rolling that over. Whereas we're starting from scratch with these other negotiations and, um, some negotiations take 10 years before they reach a deal and some have taken even more than that. Um, I think the ambition of the UK government is to conclude dates you know, well, with, well before 10 years, but it is going to take a good while to, to complete these negotiations. Okay. It, it, um, I want to take the opportunity to... Morrison. Thank you. Thank you for your patents and for that very uh, detailed and comprehensive report. Thank you very much, uh, Seamus and Mark. Okay, uh, folks, we're moving on now to um, item number 19, the Agriculture Commodities Coronavirus Income Support Scheme. There's a memo at page 49, the statute rules page 50 to 57, memorandum of 58 to 60, and the SL5 to 61 to 62 that the committee, we considered this SL1 at the meeting on the 21st of August and were content with the merits of the policy. The purpose was to provide funding for the potato, sheep, cattle and milk producers which have suffered a loss as a result of COVID-19. The examiner said rules has drawn attention to the SR and has advised that this is broken at 21 day rule. However, she is content with the explanation by the department uh, that they were working in the context of COVID-19 and would require an urgent uh, response. Um, members, any comments about that scheme before we put it? Um, but before I put it, there's just one wee thing I was want to say is that I'd like just if anybody would emphasise to the minister that we continue to work with industry. I know that the the, the wool industry has been highlighting concerns. Uh, um, I just heard recently that the vegetable growers are also highlighting concerns because they've been impacted by the lockdown as well. 
I know that I've been contacted by some farmers who sold their cattle during the um, when the, the market prices had collapsed, but the cattle were slaughtered, slaughtered after the 30th of June uh, um, date, uh, which was a qualifying date for to receive it. So if the, I just, I'd like to see a commitment from the Minister just to continue to identify where the losses were incurred and to continue mm. working with all of the sectors in the industry. William? I'll just see one issue there, and I welcome it, the fact that uh, they've the withdrawn the requirement for the register of the VAT to the horticulture sector. Yeah, that's so the next one. That, yeah. Next one more coming yeah. yeah. that, that'll, be, that'll be very welcome, for, especially if it's you know, the medium and smaller size producers, yeah, something absolutely. the committee requested. Philip? It's not on the scheme, but, uh, well, it is on the scheme. Would it be worth the committee writing or getting a written or oral briefing on the update of the scheme? Yeah. So far? Possibly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that'd be good. Agreed? So, I'm going to put the question that the Committee uh, for Agriculture and Environmental Affairs considered SR 2021 Agriculture Commodities Coronavirus and Consport Scheme 2020, and there's no objection to the rule. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, okay, this is the, the, the ornamental horticulture um, one. Uh, pages 64 to 65 of your pack, correspondence to the Department 66 to 67. Revised SR 68 to 75. The original correspondence to the Department 76 to 78. The original SR pages 79 to 87. And the SL1 determination designation 87 to 88. You'll recall that the SL1 came for the committee last week. Um, at this point, the issue of the businesses not but registered being eligible to apply was raised and, re raised and related to the Department. And the Department has now subsequently removed the requirement for a VAT registration. That's what you were referring to right. a moment ago. And, um, you know, uh, is there any further queries on that there? Just the same point as the previous one, if we get an update on Yeah. Scheme. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. So we're content for this policy to move to the next legislative stage? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dear uh, written briefing, it's the future higher education provision of CAFRE and the knowledge delivery of the, and delivery of the knowledge transfer schemes CAFRE. The background information is, uh, is at page 90 to 91, a briefing at 92 to 93, a summary document and progress to date at 94 to 96. That the written briefing covers both the future of higher education provision at CAFRI as well as the delivery of knowledge transfer scheme. The department advises in this briefing that of the development of three additional degree level qualifications at CAFRI from 2021, which will complement the existing provision. It delivers five knowledge transfer schemes which have been part funded by the EU through the RDP 2020, 2014 to 2021. 2014 to 2020. Uh, any comments or questions on that written briefing? Happy noted. Uh, Discussion item 22, uh, discussion document on the environment plans, principles and governance. Uh, is it pages 80, 98 to 99 year pack on the public discussion document 100 to 128. The Minister intends to publish the discussion document within the next few <coughs> weeks and will run for a period of eight weeks. The discussion document covers the plans, principles and governance elements of the environment bill as it relates to here. It was due to issue in March, whoever covid um, due to COVID-19, it was not uh, deemed appropriate. While there has been no formal consultation here on the elements of the bill that extends this jurisdiction, there has been engagement with the key stakeholders and departments. The discussion document covers the following areas. Environmental improvement plans, a policy statement on environmental principles, and establishment and operation of the proposed Office for Environmental Protection. Do members have any questions they want to raise in relation to that? John? Uh, to chair, there are a number of issues. Um, uh, I'm not, of course, going to object to any discussion taking yeah. place on environmental plans and, uh, and protection. But i um, very disappointed that the, um, the the discussion paper, which references New Decade, New uh, Approach Commitments, doesn't reference one of the most fundamental commitments for some of us, which is that Northern Ireland should have its own independent environmental protection agency. The, the document um, at page 103 mentions the, um, o, the OEP. Uh, it later at 120 uh, asks actually, should it have a permanent office in Northern Ireland? That's a, a very valid question. References 104, new decade, new approach, and says that uh, matters of, uh, contained in that remain priority areas. There's um, understandably mention of green growth in there and environmental governance through the NIEA does not um, reference that 
fundamental uh, new decade, new approach commitment that I mentioned, and I'm very disappointed in that. And if the committee would agree, I would like us to ask the department to include that. I was just. I mean, it's a public discussion document, so I mean, it's obviously for the public. Does the committee would we at any point uh, make a submission in relation to it? Are we getting an opportunity maybe to discuss the contents of it with the department on it? Like a written briefing, or an oral briefing. Yep. Um, I think one of the things we did request to you, if I remember correctly, was the sunset clause as well in relation yeah. to that. Uh, Claire? Yeah, I just wanted to add to that and um, completely agree with what John has raised, you know, that the commitments in, under the new decade, new approach aren't uh, included in this one. Um, and given the recent vote in the, the chamber calling for a climate change act, and this is all completely, and that's in New Decade, New Approach as well, and it's all completely missing from yep. any discussion within this consultation. And I, I just want to raise the issue about the OEP there as well. You know, this is sort of designed in the wording within it is assuming that people are understanding the complexity and the, the narrow remit for the OEP. So unless somebody actively goes to find out what the OEP re role and remit is, then, you know, I think that that will be very much confused and overlapped with the sense of an independent environment action agency or an oversight body in some description. I think the committee also, uh, we did a non-regression clause. Okay. So we agree we want to get like a, a briefing from the department on this? Yep. Okay. Very much. So we want a synopsis now. Okay. So, Item number 23, we have a um, written briefing, the RAFSET group, updating the EAP. Um, the written briefing is from the Rural Affairs, Forest Service and State Transformation Group, page 130 and 33. It covers rural pilot schemes, the leader programme, transition, exit legislation, operational constituency planning, trader readiness and resource planning. The Department advises that there's a significant body of work being carried out, particularly in relation to the future rural policy framework and ensuring an appropriate plant health legislative framework in order to ensure that they are as prepared as possible at the end of the transition period. The Department has also advised that the State Transformation Group is working to identify and support accommodation needs post EU exit, particularly in relation to infrastructure required, and air and sea ports to facilitate L L SBS checks. Um, are our members okay to note that their briefing, or is there anything you want to particularly raise? On your packet. Okay. Um, the written briefing, uh, the CSCPG update on the exit preparations, EU exit. The written briefing from the Central Contingencies Planning Group is page 135. The group advises that it is currently reviewing all contingency and emergency response plans in order to prepare for a range of scenarios in the coming months. It has identified a current need of four, five, six additional staff to support the wider uh, delivery of Brexit and are working to fill those posts. However, there is no baseline funding for any of those staff, and this has been flagged up at DOF, that an additional 25.6 million resources required to meet those costs. Um, and that just reminds me of the comments we made by the Chief Vet with us member a few weeks ago that um, a lot of it will come out, have to come out of his budget. They don't know. Um, have any comments or do you want to note the briefing? Could I just ask, Mr. Chair, um, do we know if any of those staff have been recruited so far? And if not, would they be ready and in post by January? I mean, that's a huge Stand up and all. staff number to take on in a few yeah. weeks. Yeah. Is that something we, mm -hmm. we can make? Mm -hmm. An update on that, yeah. Okay. So we're okay to note that briefing along with putting in the request for that information, Claire suggested. A written briefing from the um, FFG group on exit uh, preparations, page 137 to 141 of your packs. The group was established a transition project within the department to coordinate the various work streams that are necessary to ensure readiness at the end of the transition period. The primary focus of the transition group's areas, areas of responsibility are legislation, funding, resources, frameworks, trade, migration, engagement, potential economic package, state aid, market standards and preparedness. The uh, paper contains a summary of each of those 
areas of each of those aforementioned areas. Is there any particular um, anything you want to raise or any questions emanating from that we want to forward to the department? Yeah, Chair, possibly on that section of migration um, that there's mention there of um, ornamental horticulture, fish catching and, and other things with the, these labour related issues are very important. I mean, we heard another example today uh, which will relate directly to the movement of food and farming goods um, across the, the channel um, where the uh, eligibility of, of workers will be a, a major issue. So might be worth perhaps referencing through the department that we've had it highlighted to is that there are other not unrelated areas where they may want to consider this issue as well. It's a massive issue, particularly in the food processing uh, industry here in the north. Thank you, John. The uh, written briefing from the, the VSAHGS group, um, from the Veterinary Service and Animal Health Group, page 143 to 145. Group has established uh, SBS controls and vision project coordinate the work required across all SBS areas. Uh, it aims to ensure the department is operationally and legislatively prepared to meet the requirements of the protocol by the 1st of January. The briefing focuses on legislation, point of entry preparations, policy development, and common frameworks. If members, any comments on that report? Right. So, 27 chairperson's business. There's an informal meeting held with the House of Lords EU subcommittee um, Tuesday this week, uh, which you all attended. The uh, press release came out, and which members have set off and has been released to the local press. In terms of the issues that were discussed, there were two questions that the House of Lords raised with members that I want to come back to. The first is concerning training for businesses using the Trader Support Services. Members will be aware that a £200 million contract was recently awarded to a consortium led by Fusitru. Uh, it was due to go live at the end of September. The 1st of January goods entering here from Britain will need customs declarations. The Traders Post Service will see this consortium carrying out those checks on behalf of local businesses and will be free of charge. This aspect of the new exit will probably rest more with the economy committee than with our committee. I suggest we write to the Economy Committee and to DERA asking if there is any further information on the rollout of this work and what of any training is being delivered to enable local companies to be ready in time to use this new system. Okay. Second issue is it relating to the monies required by DERA to implement the various aspects of the protocol. We heard during the evidence from the Permanent Secretary that DERA would have to foot some of these costs itself. Can we I propose that we write to DERA asking for an update on the estimate of these costs? including breaking down the major elements of what communications there have been with the uh, UK government on funding for these costs. I also understand that a second tender for the SBS checks of the port has been issued and it might be useful to seek an update on that aspect as well. Okay. Uh, draft minutes. The draft minutes held on the 1st of October, pages 148 to 145. I ask members to note that there is an error in the minutes and that we, they show that Harry left the meeting at 11.33 but not coming back again. <laughs> they been revised and the revised version is tabled at papers page 51. It did come. Uh, <laughs> that, okay, so matters arising then. Uh, I want to refer members to the draft letter at 1.58. Uh, members okay if I sign these minutes? Yeah. Yeah, but... Um, Draft letter, page 158 to 159, and the response from the clerk assistant, Paul Gill, on the query raised in relation to the NICS guidance to departments, and it is page 162. Members are okay to note this piece of correspondence? Yeah. Members recall it was agreed at last week's meeting that a letter should be issued to the SA committees in Westminster to outline our concerns with the consideration of SAs from the department. The letter has now been included in your packs. Um, any comments from members in the wording of the letter, or are you confirmation? Are you content with what's in the letter? Page one sixty-two. Was okay with that? Yeah. yeah. Correspondence. Uh, or they, there's correspondence received at one sixty-nine to two hundred. Your packs. 
want to draw attention to the email correspondence at page 172 from the Ulster Angling Federation requesting a meeting with the committee to discuss its concern on the decline in water quality and the ongoing failure to meet targets in the Water Framework Directive. I seek agreement that we organise a virtual informal meeting with the UAF for a, for a Tuesday lunchtime in November. I am members who wish to attend can do so. Yeah. Okay with that? Yeah. Right. I refer members to an item of table correspondence from Rosemary at pages, page 60. Rosemary has asked that we can write to the department to seek an urgent response to the issue of the recent heavy rainfall resulting in difficulties getting machinery onto land and asking for an extension to the story spread and downline. Um, Rosemary, do you want to add anything to that? Or? But that's basically, I was approached by a number of farmers in the West. They were asking, could there be an, some sort of extension to yep. the deadline? Um, are you okay for Larry being sent from us to the, the committee for the department for response? Mm -hmm. Members happy to action. Sorry? I just meant to add that I had a number of farmers contact me in relation to the yeah, same right. issue, yeah. yeah. Well, members happy to action the remainder of the correspondence outlining the corresponding index sheet of page 164 to 168. Okay. Board work programme. I want to refer members to the board work programme of pages 202 to 207. Stella, do you want to update the committee on the forward work programme? I was just going to just suggest that you maybe just do AOB and then we just have a very quick close yeah, discussion problem. on that. Yeah. Okay, so AOB, um, okay then, go away. So, any other business? Any other yeah. So, the next meeting will take place uh, this day, week, Thursday, the 15th of October, at uh, 9 o'clock in this room here, room 30 of Parliament Buildings. And um, now go to uh, adjourn the meeting. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.